really believe that. You know, my physical state is I could be going to sleep in an hour. And I still I come to the crucial uh, and short workshop up hours to that for political economy of men and women of all people. I was just briefly uh, informed that the project uh, of the in, in this kind of continuation of the project that it was initiated, the third project initiated by Institute of Justice Zagreb and Academy of Media Life in Ljubljana, plus I first forward to Judith the, to the research. And together in this past year and a year, presentation, <laughs> year and a week, this research workshop is a part of the Time Your Violence uh, program that is dedicated to the new 9-11 movement. And together with these two things, you can go to a here. <laughs> this is a space, this is an uh, exhibition, sites of installations, pr process of many learning. Uh, with the subtitle, it's enough, it is not enough to write a level of summation. Uh, I will just say a few uh, technical remarks that uh, today we will start with the visual flashlight moderated by uh, Sanja Hrvatinci. Uh, and uh, uh, we will continue with the, uh, with the panel of discussion start with uh, Vedra Mizuchina, George Lukas, Tim Matvorovic. After those two remarks of the technical field, and we will be uh, back with the presentations from Mila Karalic, Anna Knezovic, and Brigitte Rigobert. So today's program, we will play it with the streaming at 8 o'clock here at this place. And uh, thank you that for you to announce that the uh, conversation with uh, Vladimir Lončar probably will be canceled. And uh, instead of uh, this, we will have a conversation with uh, uh, between Paul Tad and uh, Srpska Jakovina. And uh, this is an Jan Zemjani program. And also that we postponed presentation of Joe's uh, magazine review with any of Sanja Hrvaticic or Iva Kovac for the 15th of August. So I, I will give the floor to Sanja uh, and uh, Vijay and uh, all of you enjoy in, in this meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Vijay, are you here? Can you, can we hear you? you yes, I'm here, okay. I'm here. Right, yeah. great. It's it's amazing to see you. Uh, I it's a really uh, a pleasure and honor uh, to uh, be in the position uh, to moderate this uh, this discussion with you. Uh, I will just uh, present Vijay Prashad, whom I'm um, certain uh, most of you uh, know, know his work, and follow his. Uh, very uh, productive uh, activist work. Um, so Vijay Prashad is an Indian historian, journalist, er, journalist writer, and director of uh, Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. Uh, he is the author of a number of um, uh, books and studies, um, and I'm gonna uh, name only a few recent. Washington Bullets, by monthly Review Press 2020, with the foreword by Evo Morales Aima, Red Star Over the Third World, Pluto Press 2019, Red October, The Russian Revolution and the Communist Horizon, New uh, Left World Books 2017, The Death of the Nation and the Future, Future of the Arab Re Revolution, University of California Press 2016, Letters to Palestine, Verso Books 2015, Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South, Verso Books 2013, with the foreword of Butros Butros Gali, uh, the Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, um, The New Press 2007, and many, many others. He is also the chief editor of the Left World Books uh, based in New Delhi. Uh, today, Vijay Prashad will um, talk uh, on the topic of dilemmas of humanity, and I welcome you all to prepare your questions, uh, which will be, uh, it will be possible to pose uh, after, uh, after his talk. So we, Jay, the floor is, is yours. Okay, uh, Elisa, it's great to see you again. It's been a long time since we walked around in Berlin and, and uh, uh, tried to find interesting things to do. Um, well, I, I wish I had been there in person. Um, 
you know, uh, I would like to have gone and seen the island of Briuni. That would have been a personal, um, real pleasure for me, but unfortunately did not happen. Um, this month, um, September, is the 60th anniversary of the non-aligned meeting, the non-aligned movement meeting in Belgrade, where, um, where some of it all began. Um, some of it all began because, of course, a lot of it begins before Belgrade, much before Belgrade. Um, a lot of it begins in the fields and, and, and factories uh, across the world where ordinary people began their struggles against colonialism, against um, a particularly wretched form of capitalism that had inflicted the colonies uh, from the plantation colonies of the Caribbean um, to the uh, plantation colonies of the Indies. Um, so that old long struggle culminated in, um, in a decolonization process in the 1940s and 1950s um, when it became clear to the countries that were winning their freedom, their independence, that they needed to do more than merely win what um, many had called flag independence. You know, you put run your flag up the flagpole and you feel, well, look, I'm now an independent country. Uh, far from that. There was a very much subscribe, uh, constrained independence, uh, subscribed, uh, 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 very much uh, constrained ability to make a agenda in the world whether this was financial or whether it was cultural even. Um, and so when the countries, 29 of them came to Bandung, Indonesia, at the initiative of the Indonesian government, um, at that conference in 1955, they struggled to put together a vision uh, for the world from their perspective, you know, which again ran the gamut from economic power and political power to cultural power. Um, there's a very long section on culture in the final declaration from Bandung. Um, and then, you know, uh, six years later, the initiative of Gamal Abdul Nasser of Egypt at the initiative of Joseph Bros Tito of uh, Yugoslavia and of Jawaharlal Nehru of India, um, the countries came to uh, Belgrade. And now, not only from Asia and Africa, who had been at Bandung, but also from Latin America, led in a way by the Cubans, uh, by President Dorticos, uh, into this new process called the Non-Aligned Movement. Um, and the NAM launched in 1961, again, 60 years ago, um, had a considerable impact in, on the world. And again, they tried to develop an understanding of what it could mean to live outside the constraints set by, um, by imperialism just to be totally clear, uh, that was where the problem lay. Uh, yes, you know, the Soviet bloc was powerful and so on, but nothing compared to the power of imperialism, um, whether it was the constraints on political power, economic power, social power, and cultural power. Uh, the principal suffocator in the world uh, was seen to be coming out of um, a bloc organized around Washington, D.C., and that was the spirit of, of Bandung, and that was, of course, the project of NAM, uh, articulated at its highest point at the 1973 non-aligned meeting in Algeria, where there was the creation um, of the new international economic order. Now, I'm not saying anything to you that you don't already know. Um, the reason I want to start here is I want to be very clear that a uh, look back at, at NAM, a look back at, at Bandung even, um, a look back at non-alignment uh, should not come with nostalgia as the principal uh, mode of, 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 uh, of, for the glance backward. You know, don't look over your shoulder uh, because, you know, the present is so ugly, we take refuge in the past. Um, that's not a good enough reason to glance backwards. Yesterday, I read a, a, a manuscript put together by the very great South African um, militant fighter, uh, Ronnie Casserles. Ronnie, you know, was um, a great uh, anti-apartheid fighter, uh, then later became part of the first government of Nelson Mandela and so on. Ronnie is getting ready to release a new book. And in the book, he's decided to 
um, bring together the great um, uh, solidarity movement of the Ubuntu, Operation Ubuntu. He had been tasked by the um, African National Congress to go out there and build um, material solidarity networks. So he went, was in England, uh, he went to other countries, and he made contact with um, African solidarity organizations, and they began to do material things. You know, they raised funds for the ANC's training, uh, they raised funds for equipment, and so on. And, you know, Ronnie has brought together all their voices. Um, it opens with a forward by Pelo Jordan, another very, very well-regarded anti-apartheid fighter, and it has voices of people from across the world talking about the specific things they did to help build the international anti-apartheid movement. Well, you know, I read the, the various contributions, many of them, and I felt uh, two sensations, and I want to convey those sensations. The first sensation was I went back to that period. I, I remember being part of, you know, as a student um, of the anti-apartheid movement, and I felt drawn back into that era. And that's that sensibility of, of perhaps nostalgia or history, because there is something, um, there isn't an enormous gap, you know, there isn't an enormous amount of space that divides these two concepts of history and nostalgia. You glance backward, what's the mode, what's the, the attitude you have in your glance backward? Um, so, you know, on the one side, I read that and I felt drawn back into the anti-apartheid movement, the sense of being involved, the excitement, the, the, the imperative, you know, the great anger at, at the crime of apartheid and so on. And um, I was drawn to that. Uh, at the same time, there was another way in which I was reading the essays, a, a way where my head was turned over my shoulder and looking straight at the same time. Uh, not exactly Janus faced because in a sense, the glance backward was also a glance forward. Um, and what that second sensation was, I, I felt as I read it, I felt, how does one recreate that movement today? Um, how do we build that movement now? Uh, I mean, there are, there are so many urgencies now, so many, you know, um, uh, abominations now. How, how do we build that kind of movement now? Uh, that sort of international movement where people feel gripped uh, by a great struggle and where they feel um, they must be involved, in, again, in a material, tangible way. This glance backward, this glance forward, um, a very powerful feeling um, of, 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 of the historical consciousness, you know, uh, being drawn in these two directions at the same time. Um, I suppose when I was reading Ronnie's book, I felt very much like well, you know, isn't that how I always felt about the non-aligned process? Um, when I first decided to look back and write uh, The Darker Nations, the glance back was never for nostalgia, you know, what happened then. It was always to understand um, why were we in such a difficult position now and how do we advance, um, not the same agenda because the context is different, but how do we produce an agenda um, or, or at least a dynamic, you know, this sense of independent development. How do we produce this dynamic now? What lessons can we learn? Um, what lessons can we learn from the production of the new international economic order? And, and I'm, I'm going to get to that in a minute. I've spent the last uh, 15 years of my life working on, on this, as have many other people, and I'm going to talk about it uh, in a minute or so. Okay, so that's the context in which we're in, that's the 60 year anniversary of, of the NAM, you know, happy birthday NAM. Um, and, and I'm very glad that, uh, you know, I'm with you today and, and you're in Yugoslavia, uh, the birthplace of the NAM. I'm glad that we can say the name Yugoslavia, even though Yugoslavia might not exist on the map anymore. Uh, so I'm glad to be with you in Yugoslavia, uh, the birthplace of the NAM. Uh, 60 years later, to think about that glance backward, um, half nostalgia backward, and then looking forward, what do we do to build um, that dynamic now in a context radically different? Well, um, part two. Part two is about where we are now. Uh, that was just part one, how to look back. 
Well, where we are now, um, we are in a context that's extremely difficult. Um, day before yesterday, or not day before yesterday, a few days ago, um, I had a very good conversation with the new foreign minister of Venezuela, um, who is leading alongside his um, his uh, permanent representative to the United Nations, who's leading a process called the Group of Friends in Defense of the UN Charter. There are only 18 countries. Well, but because China is one of the 18, and you know Russia and, and some other considerably large countries, the Group of Friends includes um, countries that account for 25% of the world's population. Um, that means one in four people is represented in this Group of Friends in Defense of the UN Charter. It's considerably more representative um, then the G7, the group of seven countries, uh, certainly more representative than the United States, um, with a sum total of 320 million people out of uh, 7.9 billion. Um, so the group of friends in defense of the UN Charter uh, was set up earlier this year as, a, um, as an independent body inside the UN state system. Um, the purpose of the group of friends in defense of the UN Charter is extraordinary. Uh, because it's set up to defend the UN Charter, which is the greatest consensus document we have in the world. Uh, it's the greatest consensus document because 193 uh, member states of the United Nations have accepted it. You know, just think about this. The UN Charter was adopted in 1945, initially by 50 countries in the world. Today, um, three quarters of uh, a century later, um, what do we have? We have 193, that is basically all the countries in the world have accepted the UN Charter as a document that they, they actually uh, say they will adhere to. Um, there is no other text uh, that the countries of the world have accepted at this level. It is the greatest consensus text in, in the planet. Um, and yet, of course, um, 18 countries had to get together uh, now, you might say, well, look, you know, I mean, who are they? There's Iran, there's Russia, there's China, there's Venezuela, there's Cuba, Nicaragua, uh, Syria, and so on. Well, there's a good reason why these 18 countries have, have come together, because they have made, I think, quite correctly the claim that they are facing great violations of the charter uh, by powerful countries, mostly the United States. In other words, they are victims of what um, they call, but also the UN Special Rapporteur Elena Duan calls, um, they are victims of criminal unilateral sanctions. Um, you know, the embargo against Cuba as a case in point, an embargo that's as old almost, uh, you know, as the NAM. Um, it's as old as the NAM, 60 years old. So in that sense, these 18 countries have come together saying, we um, defend the UN Charter. Um, just after talking to uh, Felix, the new foreign minister of Venezuela, I had uh, the chance to talk to uh, Sasha Laurenti, who is the secretary general of ALBA TCP, nine countries of the um, Caribbean and Latin America that are part of a treaty process. Uh, this is the Bolivarian areas of the Americas. And Sasha made a comment which really struck me. He said, you know, I wonder if the charter, the UN Charter is put to a vote today. I wonder if it will pass. Um, it's a clarifying thought. Would it pass? Um, there are, after all, great constraints on how sanctions can be applied to um, in the interstate system. You know, for instance, without a UN um, resolution, a sanctions regime is illegal. That's why I use the word illegal and criminal in defining sanctions. There is no UN resolution um, for a sanctions regime against Venezuela, case in point. Um, that sanctions policy by the United States is unilateral and therefore illegal. Um, you, you should go back and read chapter six and chapter seven of the UN Charter. Uh, chapter six lays out specifically uh, what are the various formulas by which um, you know, economic boycotts and so on can be put forward and you require uh, at, at a base at a base level you require a UN resolution uh, there is no UN resolution
to have this uh, blockade of Cuba. Th there is simply no resolution. It is completely an illegal policy. It's a unilateral policy maintained by one country. Now, any country in the world has the legitimate right um, to not have trade relations with another country, but it cannot enforce th that right against third countries. And that's what the United States does. That's what makes it illegal, that the US government uh, it makes third countries follow its policies against uh, a, a fellow member state. The f blockade, for instance, of Iran, where the U.S. will not allow Europe to trade with Iran, that's, that is, uh, um, you know, creating a conspiracy against a member state of the United Nations, once again, against the U.N. Charter. So we have a body of, of uh, 18 countries representing one in four uh, people on the planet. Uh, we have a body in place now uh, which is picking up the UN Charter. When I read their recent declaration, I was drawn back uh, to the attitude of the NAM. Because if you go back to the NAM, again, um, the NAM's foundational charter is the UN Charter. Uh, the NAM, of course, has declarations and, you know, study them and look at them and so on. But underlying the entire NAM process um, is the UN Charter, you know, th that is what gives it a purchase. Uh, that's what allowed the NAM then uh, to operate so decisively in the UN system. Um, it's why the NAM countries fought very soon after the formation of the NAM uh, to create something which became the UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, uh, first director general being the very considerable Raoul Prebich. Um, UNCTAD was created uh, by the NAM in 1964, three years later. Um, the UN Charter is the foundational document of the NAM, and of course now it uh, has a group to defend it. Why? Because these countries feel that the UN Charter is being routinely violated. Um, a coup in uh, Bolivia against the legitimate government of Evo Morales in 2019, 10 years before that, a coup in Honduras against the legitimate government of Manuel Zelaya, uh, a coup in Japan, which many of you may not have heard of, in 2009 against Prime Minister Hatoyama. Um, these are all, you know, uh, so these are non-legitimate uh, actions driven by the United States government. Uh, the new military pressure campaign against China, uh, decidedly against the UN Charter, you know, um, these, the non-proliferation treaty recently violated by the creation of this Australia-UK-US project called AUKUS, uh, the sale of nuclear-powered submarines uh, to Australia, violation of the non-proliferation treaty, for which Australia is a signatory, a violation of the Treaty of Rarotonga, uh, for which Australia is a signatory. Uh, the Treaty of Rarotonga establishes a nuclear um, you know, uh, nuclear-free zone in the South Pacific. Uh, again, Australia, based on the UN Charter, a signatory of both the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, 1973, Treaty of Rarotonga, I think it's either 78 or 82, um, who is not a, a signatory of, of these kinds of things? The United States government, which didn't even sign the Treaty of Rome to establish the International Criminal Court. Oh, sorry signed the Treaty of Rome, but didn't ratify it, um, re rejected it, uh, and therefore is not a, a party to the International Criminal Court, a, a central organ to, to establish justice on the world stage. Um, of course, being in Yugoslavia, you'll see how, um, how unevenly justice is meted out in the ICC. It's meted out uh, largely to African leaders and to Yugoslavian uh, People. And whether they deserve it or not is, is not uh, germane to me. Uh, the most important thing is it's not meted out to anybody from the United States. In fact, when um, Special Prosecutor Fatih Ben Souda attempted to open a file on US war crimes on Iraq and on Afghanistan, she and her family were personally sanctioned. Uh, again, talk about the use of unilateral criminal sanctions. Uh, now, how were they sanctioned? Um, the uh, U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, denied her a visa to come in and testify before the U.N. Security Council and publicly threatened to say, we're not going to give visas to any of your family members. 
uh, that's the use of extraordinary power. Uh, it's also, to some extent, a violation of the agreement between the United Nations and the U.S. government uh, for why the um, the uh, you know United Nations was established in New York City. Uh, uh, Felix, the new foreign minister of, of Venezuela, was given a visa to enter New York for the um, for the General Assembly session. But the visa specifically stipulated he had to remain within 20 miles of the UN building, couldn't go beyond that. But that was the specific stipulation of the visa. Um, you know, these are violations of the agreement held between the United States government to host the UN. So 18 countries get together, group of friends to defend the UN Charter. What's the ground under which this defense is necessary? Well, one of them, of course, is the um, is the kind of regime change mentality that uh, we have in the planet and this use of sanctions. You know, what at tricontinental, the range of this form of aggression uh, we call hybrid war. Um, the development of extraordinarily sophisticated technologies of hybrid war uh, put forward by the United States and its, its allies, but principally by the United States. Okay. We know that we have a problem and why this group of friends is necessary. And again, at our institute, we have a theory of, uh, we put forward at least a, an understanding of three different apartheids, um, three different ways to understand uh, the contemporary apartheid. And I quickly go over them. And then I want to talk about the five controls and then this, this document that um, we're producing, which will release on the 16th of October. Um, and then, Sanya, we can have a conversation. I, ho I hope that will be uh, sufficient. Okay. So, group of friends meets. Um, the context is the pandemic. And uh, underneath that are serious problems, one of which is the sanctions and the regime change and so on. But let me talk specifically now about the three apartheids, which should be seen in the context of uh, strategies of intimidation, which we call the hybrid war. Um, the first apartheid is money apartheid. Um, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing. You, you know the, the, how this works. If you're a rich person and you walk into a bank, uh, and, and you can borrow money at, you know, minus uh, interest rates. Uh, that's how um, banks are being, being provided, uh, you know, money by the central banks, is that the interest rate is basically negative. Uh, but if you're a poor person and you go to borrow money, they may charge you 20%. And the reason they do this is they say, well, you're more risky. There's a greater chance that you'll default and therefore money is more expensive for you. This is exactly how um, international borrowing works. You know, when a poor country comes to the banks, money is more expensive than when a rich country comes to a bank. Um, you borrow for a range of reasons. I don't have time to get into it. Um, but for a range of reasons, some of it had to do with the long-term uh, third world debt crisis, which, you know, um, is a consequence of, of, of financial manipulation, the London interbank borrow, borrow rate, offer rate, and so on, not necessarily uh, anything other than that. But uh, financial manipulation built upon the inequalities set in place by colonialism and so on. Um, so that's why countries are poor and that's why they borrow. Um, and when they borrow, uh, they borrow at high rates. Uh, the money is expensive for them. And the wealthy bondholders who lend to them, whether it's the Paris or London group, you know, whether it's the um, private lenders, commercial lenders, or it's the government lenders, uh, they're pretty strict about getting their money back and making sure payments uh, come in in due course. Um, this is why during the pandemic, when there was a lot of hue and cry about um, debt suspension, some debt forgiveness, not exactly debt abolition, but mainly it was debt suspension, changing the timetable for paying back and so on. There was a lot of noise about this, but the US Treasury Department put its foot down and you got very little uh, relief for countries that had borrowed uh, money at quite high interest rates and couldn't get away with, um, you know, were not able to stop paying. And that's the reason why um, during the pandemic, we had in 2020, 64 countries in the world out of 193, um, that we could find 64 countries in the world spent more money last year paying off their debt. In other words, paying wealthy bondholders, mostly in Europe and in North America, um, 64 countries spent more paying off their debt than they did in healthcare. 64 countries, imagine that. 
um, the external debt, total external debt of the developing countries is about $11 trillion. That's a lot of money, but it's only one third of the amount of money that we could find uh, sitting in, in illicit tax havens. Uh, there are roughly $37 trillion sitting in illicit tax havens, three times the amount of the total external debt of the developing countries. Yet um, money apartheid means the um, suspension or the cancellation of debt is no longer on the agenda. Countries are put over the rack and face to pay. Um, that's the context in which countries are living. And as I said, 64 countries during the pandemic spent more on uh, servicing their debt than they did on healthcare. Um, and many of the countries spent more on uh, servicing the debt than they did on healthcare plus education. Um, I mean, education, you know, we talk about digital divide. Uh, please, got to talk about an electricity divide. In Afghanistan, maximum, this is just numbers from earlier this year, maximum 35% of Afghan people have electricity in their homes. You know, one in three Afghans have electricity in their homes. That is to say, they have electrical connections in their homes. Ask a Lebanese person, what's the value of an electrical connection? It's significant, but is power coming every day? No, there are regular power cuts. Um, in Afghanistan, one in three have electricity connection. Uh, then you should find out, try to do a survey, how many people have access to the internet? Uh, how many people have computers and so on? You know. Education funding collapsed in many countries to zero because they shut down schools and so on. And there was no attempt at, you know, bringing children online. They just closed down education. Many countries lost, um, you know, years. Uh, by the way, just uh, think about this, that, uh, you know, when we talk about, uh, about money apartheid, uh, think about the fact that currently uh, the 650 I've forgotten the exact amount. Anyway, the, the amounts of money, five something billion dollars that the, the Afghan government had in its own central bank has been denied it because the previous government put that money into the Federal Reserve in New York as safekeeping. And the US government has basically denied the current government of Afghanistan access to its own money. Uh, whatever you think of the Taliban, and I think very little of it, they should at least access that money so they can import foodstuffs and all that and avert uh, starvation in Afghanistan. But the U.S. government has said, no, the door is closed. And the IMF has said, uh, on instructions from the U.S. Treasury Department, the door is closed. We call that money apartheid. The second form of apartheid in our time is medical apartheid. Um, I don't have to get too much into that. Just mentioned Afghanistan, you may not know because you know, Afghanistan has so many cascading problems. You may not know that the vaccination rate uh, in Afghanistan is 1.1%, uh, and that's almost 100% inside Kabul. Uh, there is no real attempt to vaccinate anywhere else. The public health system was destroyed, uh, not just during the Taliban 96 to 2001, but in the 20 years of US occupation. Very little attempt to build a good, robust public health in infrastructure. 1.1% um, is the vaccination rate in Afghanistan. And I can tell you, given the way in which things are going, it's not going to increase. Um, you know, uh, it's not just Afghanistan, major US ally in Africa, Rwanda, currently in an intervention in no Northern Mozambique in the province of, of Cabo Delgado, Rwanda's vaccination rate is 5%, um, incredibly low, you know, and, and with no sign of, of that increasing. Medical apartheid, well, we know that um, the COVAX facility, hugely underfunded. We know that, um, you know, uh, vaccinations, th third jabs are going to be taking place in Europe and, the, and North America, where for much of the world, they'll not see the first jab before 2024. Uh, we know that. We know that uh, there's an incredible technology in the mRNA technology. They will not lift uh, the patent waiver as India and South Africa have asked at the World Trade Organization. There's no hope of that, no scope of raising the patent waiver. Um, Cuba has designed uh, its own public sector vaccines, Russia, China, they are trying to distribute them. Uh, but, you know, it's not easy because there's a transportation problem, a cold chain problem. Um, there's also a problem of production. Many parts of the world, uh, they destroyed their medical 
uh, industrial infrastructure because uh, they came under pressure from the International Monetary Fund, uh, under pressure to slice that, to take advantage of, of so-called complementarities or comparative advantage. Uh, and they let the independent regional medical infrastructure go. They don't have the capacity to produce um, syringes, to produce uh, the vaccine and so on. 60% of the world's syringes are made in India. Um, you know, that's because of this, the theory of comparative advantage. Well, you can't get it from India now uh, to other countries. Cuba cannot easily import syringes as a consequence of the blockade. So the second form of apartheid is medical apartheid. The, the third is, um, is food apartheid. It's a real gripping problem. You know, we, we're seeing hunger rates rise. Um, uh, earlier this year, the Food and Agriculture Organization released a report where they said nearly one in three people in the world, 2.37 billion, do not have access to adequate food. Um, it's 2.37 billion people don't have access to adequate food. An increase of about 320 million in a year, in just one year. Uh, that's the increase in, in, in hunger and suffering of that kind. I mean, hunger is a totally intolerable thing. It has related, of course, to education. If you don't eat, you can't hear properly. You know, you have that loud noise in your head, um, makes it impossible to concentrate, to focus, and so on. Anyway, so um, that's the three apartheids uh, that we live under. Uh, you know, you want to glance back at the NAM, uh, you got to uh, look at the context today, maybe even more difficult as a context than it was in 1961. Oh. Question to be raised, um, why is this so? I mean, it's something that we've seen is we've seen the transfer of um, factories and production into the third world. Um, why hasn't the industrialization of, of you know, parts of the third world created um, a different form of, of progress and so on? Well, because um, the transfer of, of factories took place, but not control over, over production, not control over the process. And, and I want to talk a little bit um, about the five controls in the world, uh, which structure uh, things in an adverse way for the bulk of the people on the planet. Um, I'll quickly go over these five controls and then I'll talk about a plan to save the planet. Okay. Um, I, I can't see you guys, so I hope that this is, you know, logical and, and rational and you can follow what I'm saying. It's not too much of a ramble. Uh, so, I mean, let me know somehow. Uh, if it's not coming across well. Five controls. Um, what are the five ways in which um, the world system reproduces itself in such a way that certain countries remain extremely wealthy and others uh, remain or rather struggle uh, for survival? Um, what are the, the five controls? Um, the first control is a control over science and technology. Um, you know, it's okay to, to transfer industry. Um, that's acceptable. We'll, we'll transfer factory uh, to, you know, South Korea or somewhere. Uh, but to transfer science and technology, that's where things get complicated. And that's the reason why in 1980s, um, and actually right after the 1973 NAM meeting, um, you, had a, you had a lot of pressure to uh, consolidate the interna international patents regime. And uh, the patents regime was changed in the last Uruguay round of the general agreement on trade and tariffs the, um, in the 1980s, so that patents move from process patenting to product patenting. And when you product patent, you basically uh, allow corporations to control um, the system of science and technology. Uh, and this attack on piracy becomes enormous, you know, um, and this afflicts the cultural world as well you know, where um, we, the, our enemy, the enemy of culture makers um, is, is patents and control over intellectual property. I mean, I, I, I edit in a publishing house, we are very happy to see people just take our work, you know, um, because there's a difference between cultural cross-fertilization, credit, and then monetary control over your ideas. You know, we all want to make a living but I don't want to make a living by collecting rent of patents. You know, I want a different form of making a living. I'd like to see people, um, you know, take ideas and, and expand them and, and, and let them germinate and so on. This applies to 
uh, medical research, pharmaceutical research, all the way out to um, you know to to cultural research. That's one reason I dislike individual prizes. You know, I don't like it. I I, I hate prizes. I, I've never received prizes in my life except one prize from uh, the Communist uh, Party in West Bengal for darker nations, actually. Uh, but I don't like prizes because prizes gives the impression that the singular person is um, is you know is is uh, has within them something unique and different than everybody else. When our cultural products are, are not unique, our cultural products are social. Uh, we produce things socially. You know, even these ideas I'm r reflecting with you on these are not my ideas. These have been produced socially. Uh, they have been produced in a in a process. They've been produced by a range of people. I'm merely transmitting it to you. But there is a way in which capitalism makes a commodity of everything. And even people, uh, culture makers, have got sucked into this idea of commodification and and desperately trying to control their uh, production as if it is indeed theirs that they are the singular author and they need to get compensated for, for it and so on. We should never try to have our compensation tied to uh, rent collecting. You know, we've got to think about it more creatively. Anyway, the first point is control over science and technology. And you see, therefore, this attack on China in our current period is really because China has innovated in five or six areas of, of uh, technology and scientific production. You know, green technology, um, high-speed trains, robotics, uh, 5G technology, and so on. I mean, why did they go so much after Huawei? Uh, you know, they said, oh, Huawei is going to take your information and deliver it to the Chinese government. Meanwhile, Edward Snowden has already told you that all your information going to U.S. Uh, tech companies goes directly to the National Security Agency. You know, that was proved in the, the PowerPoint presentation Edward Snowden released, you know, when he left his job as a contractor at the National Security Agency. People don't seem to be worried about their data going to the NSA, the world's largest spy agency, uh, but they are terrified that the Chinese might get their data. Uh, that's part of what I'm coming to later, which is the information control issue. But the first issue is, control over science and technology. The second is control over financial systems. Um, you know, we all use dollars to reconcile our trade, to reconcile payments between different countries and so on. It's not easy to move to another currency, you know, and I'm not going to get into that, but it's not easy because it requires, a, you know, country after country to accept a third party currency, which is not the dollar. And the euro didn't work out very well. Still, there's no, you know, real... A sense of using the yuan, the Chinese currency, um, renminbi, you know, it's just not on the table. People don't use the yen, for instance, as the mediating currency. We still return to the dollar. And that's because we don't have an international currency um, denominated in some international mechanism uh, to reconcile trade. We return to the dollar. Uh, that gives the United States government a huge amount of control over the financial system. Um, we use various international networks, including the SWIFT system, which is based in Belgium, uh, in, the, in the EU. It's based in the European Union. Uh, when the Europeans and the US want to cut a country off from the financial system, they just shut the door from the SWIFT. That's what was done to Iran. Sorry, you can't use SWIFT anymore. So Iran doesn't have a means to pay other countries, you know, short of sending, you know, literally gold on ships and so on. Um, you don't have access to that electronic payment mechanism. Uh, there are very few real genuine alternatives. So control over financial systems, that's the second thing. Uh, third, control over access to resources. You don't need to control the resources directly. You don't need to go in and colonize mines and, and so on. You can let Countries have independent control of their mind, but you have control over access to resources. Um, we see this in, in countries like Zambia, where the United States Embassy, working with the International Monetary Fund, makes it very clear um, to the Zambian government who, and who can um, get contracts to mine or get access to the resources and who cannot. Um, you know, when, when they don't want to, they say this Russian company can't come in or this Chinese company you know, cannot be um, uh, allowed to get access to resources. In other countries, they say, yes, send it to, you know, uh, through 
uh, Glencore, for instance, you can have the cobalt, uh, the cobalt and the the, the coltan uh, go to China to be processed into iPhones and so on. That's permitted, but in another country, rare earth minerals cannot be, you know, and so on and so forth. That control over access to resources is key. It's not control over resources; it's the access to resources. Fourth form of control is control over weaponry. Um, who gets to develop what weapon, who gets to sell it, and so on. It's all very well. They talk about, uh, you know, uh, this country must not get weapons. It, they make a big scandal when weapons arrive in a country, guns have arrived or, or whatever. Um, meanwhile, um, it's perfectly legitimate for Europeans and countries and North American countries to sell weapons everywhere in the world. Uh, did you see that WikiLeaks release, by the way, speaking of weapons, uh, WikiLeaks released a document from the Swedish government, which showed the sheer callousness of Sweden, where Sweden was debating whether to enter into NATO's campaign in Afghanistan in 2001. Um, and the text of the, of, the, of the leaked document showed that Sweden thought, yes, let's enter the conflict, not for human rights and women's rights and all that. No, no, that was just verbiage. They entered the conflict to test their weapon systems. It's one of the most extraordinary releases that WikiLeaks has done, which has barely got comment uh, in Europe, as far as I'm, I, I know. Uh, I mean, you know, people should be brought up into the courts to be tried for this. Um, imagine that. We're going to enter into the conflict in Afghanistan to test our weapon systems. Uh, this is exactly what the Palestinians face on a regular basis. You know, uh, there are enough leaks from the Israeli uh, defense industry which show that they are trying out new uh, weapon systems on um, on the Palestinians, basically as a as a free advertisement for their sale of weapons. Uh, I think Jeff Harper's book is very good on this. He has all the details on how Israel uses the conflict in, uh, uh, not conflict, uses the occupation of the Palestinians to test weapon systems. To control over weapons is a very fundamental part uh, over the suffocation of the planet. And finally, a uh, control over information. You go to YouTube and you take a look at uh, various news channels. If you look at, say, RT, you know, uh, what used to be Russia Today or CGTN from China, uh, underneath the channel, it'll say, this is state-affiliated media. Um, but under a BBC channel, it doesn't say this is state-affiliated media. BBC, after all, is state-affiliated. Uh, it doesn't say that. No, nor does it actually say that under Voice of America or, you know, Radio Free, Free Europe and so on. These are all, you know, state-affiliated media. Um, many of the European channels are state-affiliated media. It doesn't say that. Uh, because it so casually can uh, delegitimize, say, the media coming from Russia or China or, you know, wherever, uh, whatever they want to delegitimize. Um, information control is a very significant thing. You know, they don't like what you're saying, you're denying genocide or whatever. I mean, denial of genocide, okay, it's easy to say there's a genocide happening in Xinjiang, and if you don't accept it, you're a genocide denier. Before our own eyes, there was a genocide in Iraq. Before our own eyes, over a million people were killed. Um, in the 1990s, uh, um, before the, the current occupation from 2003, in the 1990s, um, UNICEF and UNESCO released a report um, that said that 500,000 Iraqi children had died as a consequence of the sanctions. This was a a UN report released in, in the 1990s. At the time, Ambassador Madeleine Albright, the US ambassador to the UN, was on uh, 60 Minutes talking to Leslie Stahl. And Leslie Stahl asked her, you know, directly asked her, what do you think of this UN report that says as a consequence of US sanctions, uh, half a million children have been killed? And, you know, Madeleine Albright said, it's a price worth paying. Um, why isn't that genocide? You know, uh, at what standard does that become genocide? But it doesn't. And it's partly because there is a great racist understanding of how international affairs works, because the assumption is when the West acts, it always uh, does it to, for benevolent reasons. You know, uh, West goes and destroys, destroys Libya. Well, must be to prevent genocide. Who's the genocidaire? It's always the barbarian, the savage. It's the Gaddafis, it's the Bashar al-Assads, it's the, it's the Saddams, you know. 
whatever you think about these people, the point is the genocidaire is never going to be George W. Bush or Tony Blair or, you know, or Sarkozy or Macron. Um, you know, Macron has the indecency to go to Tahiti earlier this year, so-called French Polynesia, 30 years plus of French nuclear testing in the islands of the South Pacific. No apology from the French, uh, none at all. Um, God knows how many people afflicted by cancer, France denying, denying, denying uh, what it had done there. Belgium, I was recently in, in Brussels and in Ostend, uh, Belgium, no, no confrontation with what it did in the Congo, uh, what Leopold did in the Congo, no confrontation, millions of people slaughtered. Um, and today, what do we have? U.S. troops back there under the guise of fighting ISIS Congo. Control of information. When the U.S. goes abroad, it's to tackle terrorism or this or that for always good reasons. And people give them a free pass, um, give them a free pass. And the culture workers completely guilty of this, you know, uh, transfixed by, by, you know, authoritarianism in Russia, authoritarianism in China, but complete free pass to the United States as it conducts a coup in, 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 in Bolivia, as it destroys Central America, uh, as Haitian migrants beaten on the borders of the US government, um, Haitian migrants beaten almost 11, 12 years after the US government, uh, led by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, intervenes in the Haitian parliament uh, to prevent a minimum wage bill to be passed. I, I don't know if you, you, you know that story. I write about it in Washington Bullets. Um, you know, a Haitian parliament taking up a serious question of the basic wages of Haitian workers, many of them working in the kind of uh, maquiladoras or small factories to produce textiles for the United States, They're desperate to raise minimum wages. There's a lot of pressure on them. A bill is brought forward and the US embassy intervenes. Hillary Clinton personally intervenes to scuttle that bill so that Haitian um, minimum wages are kept down. Uh, the country kept in, in, in basically a colonial uh, relationship to the US. And then people flee after a hurricane, after an earthquake, uh, after their president has been killed. There's great political insecurity in the country. They flee, come to the United States, and then you saw the images from the border. Um, but there's an information control because you get those images from the border and then the US government apologizes. But the apology is not about the beating with leather straps on the border alone. Apologize for that. That's fine. Apology is for the policy of, um, of, of holding down Haiti uh, since the revolution of 1804, but not just since 1804. Why did you intervene in the 2000s uh, to prevent the Haitian government from, um, you know, from, from raising minimum wages? And of course, this coming after two coups, twice, I think, Jean Bertrand Aristide of Haiti has the uh, honor of having been overthrown by the US government twice. Uh, twice he was coup in the 1990s and in the 2000s. Uh, and both times the US government denied it was a coup. You know, the second time the US government said, there's a plane at the airport. We think you should drive to the airport, board the plane and go to South Africa because the South African government has welcomed uh, you and you've got to leave now. Uh, that's a coup. I mean. <laughs> What, what, what's the definition of a coup? Uh, he, he was the elected, uh, democratically elected president of Haiti, told by the US government, leave now, get on that plane and go to South Africa. The second time he was coup. No apology for that. You know, th this is an information war. Uh, on what you will get is you'll get portrayed, well, you know, some barbaric, uh, Haitian, you know, lives, these very poor people, you, you're you allowed to feel sorry for the Haitians, you know, very poor people, such bad conditions. Oh, my God, terrible treatment at the border by some yokels. Biden has apologized. Everybody don't look any further. Don't bother with anything else. Go back or oh, look at the Mediterranean. OK, you know, it's some barbaric Italian government, um, right wing government, so-called populist government. They are being racist with the migrants. You let the thinking stop there. You know, in the Balkans, you see migrants coming through Greece and so on. Oh my God, the government of Turkey behaving so badly. Leave it there. Let's not ask questions of countries getting destroyed by the IMF or, you know, getting bombed and so on, which is what sets people moving in the first place. Let's not think about all that. Don't focus on that. Look elsewhere. 
That's the information war. Anyway, inspired by the um, by these, you know, the analysis of these three apartheids and five controls, and and very much inspired by the history of the new international economic order proposed by the NAM countries, um, twenty five research institutes over the last period have been working under the leadership of Alba TCP to create what we are calling a plan to save the planet, which we're going to release um, on the 16th of, 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 of October, which is World Hunger Day. And um, our plan to save the planet um, is a text which, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's just this now, but it'll look prettier when we release it. Um, it's a text that goes over um, various demands, you know, uh, questions of, you know, democracy and the world order, environment, education, healthcare, labor, um, the question of the care economy, um, you know, um, uh, the questions of food, housing, finance, um, culture, and so on. Uh, we are 25 research institutes that are from Lebanon, um, from India, from uh, Zimbabwe, from, from Cuba, from Argentina, from Bolivia, from, you know, all across the world. Um, and we've been working together to develop this document, which will be released at the United Nations on the 16th of October, um, uh, under, again, as I said, the auspices led by nine ambassadors uh, at the UN who belong to the nine countries of the ALBA process. Um, I very much hope that you'll have a look at this text when um, it comes out, that you'll find ways to intersect your work as culture workers, as as theorists and so on, um, into this process, you'll you'll try to you know enhance the discussions and debates around these issues, um, uh, bring the world into this discussion. So um, you know there are these apartheids, there are these controls, but then there is this dream of a different kind of planet that we want to create. Um, this is a plan to save the planet, and I'm not going into any details now. But if you have questions uh, about uh, what might be in it, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Vijay. Um, I hope you're still uh, with us. Uh, uh, because I uh, am confused with the screens, I'm sorry. This is the hybrid uh, mode of conferences that we are uh, experimenting with. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, this, this was a really inspiring talk, I believe, for all of us in the room and online uh, who are following. Uh, I would dare to say that there is no there is no better way to mark the 60th anniversary of a non-aligned movement, but with an um, opening keynote uh, speech uh, that is. Uh, that is uh, tackling uh, the global economic uh, situation uh, today, and that is also opening horizons uh, for alternatives. Um, and without further ado, I would like to uh, open the floor for questions, uh, uh, whether those related to the uh, analysis that you offered um, so sharply uh, or the, um, uh, of the uh, of the crisis of the of the um, um, consequences of the of the glo of the global crisis uh, through uh, the concept of upper heads uh, and um, and controls, uh, or uh, your very uh, inspiring also um, reflection on the role of historians uh, in this uh, in these conditions that you have been um, uh, describing to us. Uh, so, um, if there are any questions, I would ask. Uh, yeah, we have a question. Uh, we have a technical uh, note on that. What's the technical note? Should before uh, VJ is here with us. Yeah, I can hear fine. Uh, Thanks. Okay, so I can. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Stefan Gujbica. I'm a historian, and uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, basically, yeah. So uh, I think with the the countries you've been talking about, the situation is rather straightforward in terms of uh, 
uh, first world exploitation and so on. And since we're now here in Rijeka, uh, where would you categorize the countries of uh, the former Yugoslavia? In, uh, because, you know, if you take a place like Croatia, it, in a lot of ways you could argue that it's basically a colony of German and Austrian capital, but at the same time it also participates, for instance, in military interventions, uh, such as Afghanistan. But then if you look at places that are not in the EU, such as Serbia or Macedonia, you have some very serious struggles there between uh, sort of European Union capital, US capital, on the other side, Russia and China, even the uh, Arab capital is becoming a big factor. Uh, so on, on one hand, they're kind of a, uh, still a playground where a lot of great powers converge, and the other, they're also partially or sometimes <laughs> very fully complicit in the global imperial system. Uh, and I'm just curious, how would you categorize them? Would you, you know, can we talk here about some sort of neocolonialism or their participation in the imperialist system or, uh, I don't know, about the comprador bourgeoisie and so on? Like, where exactly would you kind of categorize them and what are the political implications of that? So um, I don't know how, how we're going to do this. So just guide me. Are we going to go one question at a time? That might be easier. I think um, so. I think we should go one question at a time. Okay, great. Well, you know, Stefan, um, you're already answering your own question. Um, I, I'm not an expert on the Balkan countries, let alone uh, the former Yugoslavia. And I, I'll admit to you, friends, that my understanding of the former Yugoslavia might be more nostalgic than anything. Um, I, I don't really have a good analysis or understanding of events post-1999. Just to be honest with you, I, I, I wouldn't know how to categorize it directly. And, and so I leave that to you because, Stefan, I think you've already started laying out the elements of an analysis. You know, uh, there are different countries positioned differently vis-a-vis -vis different um, uh, stresses and strains uh, and, and, and constraints and their own, uh, you know, the nature of their own bourgeoisie and how it relates to uh, the, on the one side EU, on the other side, let's say, Gulf capital, as you put it, United States and, and so on, Russia. I, I just don't know enough about it and I don't follow it in a regular way. On the other hand, uh, let's take a, an examples, some examples outside your region, but which are similar. Um, look at the case of Rwanda, such an interesting story. I mean, it's instructive to look at Rwanda and Yugoslavia together. Um, you know, both of them struggled with something quite terrible in the 1990s. You know, um, Rwanda had a, a, a terrible, you know, genocidal uh, genocide in the 1994, a horrible period of mass slaughter. Um, and then what happens then? Paul Kagame comes to power uh, shortly thereafter and um, is basically provided with the possibility of creating a modern military, um, uh, intervenes directly without any oversight into the eastern uh, Congo, into Goma and the surrounding areas, uh, conducts enormous violence in the eastern Congo, um, and now is basically, you know, your gun for hire uh, out there in the Central African Republic, South Sudan, and most recently, as I said, uh, in Cabo Delgado in Mozambique, I've written a series on on the Rwandan intervention into into um, into northern Mozambique. Why, why is Rwanda in northern Mozambique? Um, basically, at the behest of the French, because the French French Total has an enormous stake in alongside Exxon Mobil. Uh, has an enormous stake in a, a natural gas find off the coast of Cabo Delgado. And rather than intervene directly with French troops, um, Rwanda spent the last summer um, negotiating with the French for a French apology for its complicity in the genocide, having received near apology um, and perhaps some secret arms deals we don't know about, uh, Rwanda intervenes, sends a thousand troops into northern Mozambique. Now, can't call that Rwandan imperialism. That's ridiculous. Uh, Rwanda is operating on behalf of somebody. Um, and that's what one has to look for. Is that, you know, here it's all in the details and it's all in the kind of, uh, you know, arms agreements and the, 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 the also diplomatic cover given to Kagame so that, um, you know, the French will say, look, what happened in, in the Congo in the late 1990s and 2000s 
uh, what was uh, you know uh, brought out in the 2010 UN mapping report of violent activity in Eastern Congo, all of that can be you know set aside and and, and ignored. Nobody should bring up the 2010 uh, UN uh, mapping report on violence in Eastern Congo. Uh, forget all that. Paul Kagame is a hero. Uh, we'll we'll lift him up. And so you know there are these interesting ways in which uh, complicities occur between. Um, the bourgeoisie of a certain small country, uh, the kind of advantages it gets and so on. Uh, you know, what you're seeing in Rwanda today is perhaps the behavior of Croatia and as you described it and so on. Um, you know, who are they operating on behalf of? Uh, how much actual independent activity is going on here? You know, and, and how much is this benefiting ordinary people in the country? Um, you know, Croatia may send a detachment into Afghanistan or wherever, um, how much is, the, what is the rate of return on that investment for ordinary Croatians? Uh, something to consider. And who benefits by these, these um, interventions? You know, are you giving cover uh, to another process not directly um, available to you? Um, you know, I think that at some point um, that kind of conversation might lead one back to what was the benefit of the breakup of Yugoslavia in 1999. What was the benefit? Uh, who benefited from that? Uh, who lost? Um, what kind of animosities will continue to linger, you know, from that wretched, uh, protracted breakup, uh, the NATO bombing and so on? I, I wonder, I, I don't know enough, Stefan. I, I, I'm actually talking out of order. Um, and perhaps you couldn't send me things to read about this, but I wonder if there will ever be a reckoning. In the same way as India has never had a reckoning uh, for the breakup of, of the subcontinent. Um, first, between India and Pakistan in 1947, a million people died in that partition. Uh, my family, for instance, comes from northern Pakistan, some from Lahore into India. Part of the 13 million people exchanged between when India and Pakistan were created. And then in 1971, another breakup when Bangladesh breaks from and is created uh, from Pakistan, um, another breakup in 1971, again, you know, genocidal killing levels, killing take place in East Pakistan or now Bangladesh. Um, th there's no reckoning of that either. And the stresses and strains that continue to afflict the subcontinent, the tensions, the border disputes and so on, continue at length. Um, and we never have a good look back at it and say, you know, was it worth it? Uh, why did the British push for a partition? You know, we have all these documents from the 1940s where the British say, look, Nehru's government in India, the future government, isn't going to allow military bases in India. Uh, so we should encourage uh, Pakistan because we want to maintain a military base in Waziristan and so on. Uh, we want a presence in Central Asia. We don't really talk about that much, you know, those documents. Um, they're not talked about much, but they should be. Um, why is it the West backed a military coup in Pakistan so quickly in the 1950s uh, and, and basically encouraged the military governments in Pakistan right to the present? Uh, you know, uh, virtually Imran Khan's government fully backed by the military. Uh, when will we have a proper reckoning with the breakup of South Asia? Uh, you know, in the same way as I don't know if you have a reckoning for the breakup of Yugoslavia. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, do you want to reply? <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have another question from the audience and one uh, in, um, in the chat. Uh, so uh, please, uh, there is one question. Hello, thank you for, uh, for an amazing talk. Um, uh, my name is Daniela Majstorovic. Uh, I come from the University of Banja Luka, Bosnia and Herzegovina. One of those countries that Stefan mentioned is uh, still we're trying to figure out what's happening. It's a country that's been marked by a 25-year-long uh, international interventionism, uh, neocolonial presence of, of the uh, Office of the High Representative. Um, I'm going to speak about that uh, today. And just recently, uh, I was talking with some fellow uh, scholars from Bangalore, India, um, on how an active resistance could be done via what Samir Amin calls delinking and then perhaps relinking. And I would like to see what's your take. And w definitely one of the things that, that Bosnia and India share uh, 
at this moment is uh, nationalism. Uh, the BJP's uh, ethnocultural uh, sort of nationalism and the Bosnian-style ethno ethnic nationalism that was um, pretty much set up by the 90s wars and that pretty much still continues uh, to this day. Uh, we have seen our local comprador elites, of course, getting richer and taking parts in certain deals. Um, so maybe your take on you know, nationalism, which was seen after colonization as a way to go as liberation, especially in 1940, post-1947, and something that's happening now in India post-2014 and how it resonates, um, to me, a lot uh, with what's happening in Bosnia in terms of ethnic nationalism and like who is now the beneficiary, who, who is now, and why is it different uh, in what ways from, from the late 40s, thanks. Yeah, you know, um, you know, it's not as if the uh, roots of, of ethnic nationalism, as, as you call it, um, are new. Um, this formation was available to governments uh, after the decolonization process. They could have easily gone and grabbed it, you know. Um, it's interesting that they, out of the context of um, both colonialism and the anti-colonial struggle, decided in many cases to ignore um, this form of nationalism, uh, to fight it, actually. Uh, if you go back and read the Bandung Declaration, um, you will see under the section on culture, very great sensitivity to the dangers of, of, uh, of ethnic and religious fratricide. Very great sensitivity. I mean, as I said, India came, began, um, you know, bathed in, uh, in religious fratricide, a million people killed in the partition of India. Um, it's the birth of India and Pakistan comes with this death uh, along religious lines. Um, there's great sensitivity to this. You know, the early UNICEF project uh, in which Claude Levi-Strauss and others participated, um, the project against racism, again, was very sensitive to uh, the possibility of people turning on each other in, in, a, in a very simple, one-dimensional way. Um, and there was encouragement uh, as a consequence of the decolonization politics of what, you know, the Bandung spirit, NAM and so on, as an encouragement not to go down that road. Um, you know, what, uh, what the partisan project in, in Yugoslavia did, which was to create um, a complicated, very difficult, um, you know, non-ethnic based project. Of, it's, it's, it was not easy because it goes against the the current of, of, uh, of our human history, you know, uh, our human history keeps pulling us back into these kind of, of, of tribalisms, let's call them, um, you know, uh, it's, it's a lot easier, you know, hate is a lot easier as a political platform than love, uh, than fellowship, hate is a lot easier, it's, it's, it's easier to inflame somebody's imagination along the axis of hate, you know, that's my opinion. Um, but so I think that in that decolonization period, uh, these people, you know, they were part of a project that was trying to fashion something outside um, ethnic nationalism. But, but the deal they made with their public is very important. Basically, they said to their public, look, um, you know, we're going to ensure that you get, um, you know, social development. You know, we're going to take, we're going to make houses for people. We're going to find work. We're going to create... Uh, education, medical care, we're going to produce a modern society. And, you know, what we're asking you to do in this modern society is not allow us to go into the sewer of uh, ethnic and religious differences. Uh, we're going to try to rise above them, produce a new sense of national belonging. But the national belonging had to come with certain material possibilities. You know, the material possibilities were the kind of life raft that lifted us out of the sewer. Um, that was the basic understanding of, of the NIEO, the New International Economic Order. You've got to fight to create these material possibilities because we can then fashion a cultural transformation, the most difficult of them all, the most difficult transformation, to transform ourselves out of um, you know, these narrownesses into something different, a new kind of person, um, you know, the creation of a new sensibility. And so it's very hard to have done. Uh, but, you know, when the debt crisis strikes our countries um, in the 1979, 80, thereabouts, uh, when we all go under the heavy strain of the third world debt crisis, including Yugoslavia, uh, struck by the kind of IMF pressure, starts to 
um, you know, privatized in, in the service of lifting capital, bringing money in, uh, the so-called structural adjustment project of the IMF, um, you know, uh, the emergence of what we later will call neoliberalism, a commodification of parts of, of human life, which were to create the material basis for our new sensibility, you know, commodifying education, privatizing and commodifying education, healthcare, all these things. Uh, you eviscerate the material basis of a new kind of society and you then allow a direct U-turn back into forms of, of national belonging um, that are crude and easy uh, and vicious. And uh, in a way, you know, what you see in, in, in maybe, you know, Daniela, what you said in, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, or what you see, of course, in India, which I know much better, what you see is a U-turn into this viciousness. And um, this viciousness isn't the past, you know, reasserting itself. It's actually the, the child of neoliberalism. Um, you know, if you don't have a project, a, a genuine project that people can 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 rally around and say, "Look, I'm I'm willing to live in fellowship with other people," but we need more than than you know austerity. Um, if you give me a different project, uh, I can be a better person. And if you give me this shit, I'm going to be a shitty person. And that's where we're living, Daniela. Unfortunately, so we have a. Um question from uh, the chat and I am going to read it uh, and uh, um, since we are now some five minutes uh, we have some minutes more uh, maybe have another question and then I would kindly ask you absolutely I think we need to end Vijay with the with the, an outline of the plan uh, to save the planet uh, so let's keep a, f a few a few few minutes in, in the end uh, for that as well so uh, the question by Yure Ramshak, um, I'm going to read it now. Many thanks for this speech and for your uh, enlightening moments in a newsletter every Thursday. Describing uh, the new international economic order, historian of development, uh, Gilbert Gears, uh, states that the guiding themes of enrichment and profit remain the same as before. For him, the new international economic order even appears as the quote, the last avatar of the dominant economics, end of quote. Where do you see the greatest, sorry, where do you see the greatest revolutionary potential of the new international economic order and how would you put it into the contemporary context, considering especially environmental crisis, which might be in the opposition to the new international economic uh, order global productivist model? Well, um, you know, there's two questions there. Um, uh, the one is about the NIEO's possibility and the other is about um, the productivist, uh, or rather, let's say, um, the kind of growth-centered uh, logic of the NIEO. So let's deal with the second first, and then the first one will allow me to talk a little more about the plan to save the planet, as you had suggested. Um, Look, let's be fair and frank. Um, the environmental crisis is not being driven uh, by the poor people of Zambia. You know, 60% uh, of the children who live above the copper belt don't know how to read. Um, they are not the ones who are driving, uh, you know, growth and, and planetary destruction. By 2050 or so, um, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than there'll be fish. And that's, again, not because... Um, you know, children in Bolivia uh, are wrapping everything in plastic or going to markets and buying things in plastic wrapping and throwing it into the ocean. Uh, it's not them. We still see uh, a massive footprint, carbon footprint, garbage footprint in North America and Europe. Um, and in all these uh, climate talks, there is there continues to be a disparagement of the basic Rio formula of common and differentiated responsibilities. There's a common responsibility but it's differentiated, you know. You can't ask the people of Afghanistan, um, where, you know, as I said, uh, you know, 65% of households don't have, of people don't have access to electricity. Uh, you can't tell them, look, you know, don't electrify Afghanistan because that's going to increase the environmental crisis. Um, we would like to see the 100% electrification of Afghanistan, more renewables and so on used there for sure. But we'd also like to see some sort of degrowth paradigm set in, in, in Europe and in North America. You know, North America continues to produce 
about 30% of the world's waste, uh, the United States, uh, with, I don't know, some 6% or 4% of the world's population. Um, total outsize footprint, uh, carbon and garbage footprint uh, compared to places elsewhere. So we need to have a kind of, you know, uh, a balanced understanding of growth and degrowth and productivism. You know, I'm all in favor of, of, of cutting back on, on growth rates in certain countries, but you can't expect the government of Bolivia uh, to say, look, we're not going to uh, use our resources to improve the lives and conditions of people, you know, what we call resource socialism. You can't expect them, you know, people are, have been living for uh, a couple of hundred years in extreme poverty. Uh, that has to be changed. So I, I think we need to have a uh, bring back the real formula of common and differentiated responsibilities. And finally, um, on the planet or the, you know, this plan to save the planet, which is very much inspired by the 1973-74 NIEO, uh, New International Economic Order. I mean, we hope that this plan will become a resolution in the General Assembly in the next few years. We very much hope so. It's going to be released at the UN. Uh, we want it to be endorsed by the Group of 77. We want it to be uh, circulated by the NAM. We'd like to see if this goes any further uh, in the interstate system of the UN, but also we would like to see this discussed in social movements. And so we have a project called Dilemmas of Humanity, which will start again in late October, early November, where um, you know uh, our plan is part of a, a project that I've been involved with for the past six years called the International People's Assembly, which is a grouping of over 200 political organizations, uh, trade unions in South Africa, uh, political parties in Nepal, in, in Tunisia, um, in Argentina, and so on. And, you know, we have uh, millions of people who are members of the organizations in the International People's Assembly. Um, Tricontinental, in fact, is a project of the International People's Assembly, which will go public next month. Um, and so the IPA is going to have a, a, a global discussion called Dilemmas of Humanity, uh, rooted around this plan. And so we, we want a discussion in the interstate system. We want a discussion, um, you know, with in movement uh, locations, have, you know, conferences, debates, discussions. Uh, this plan will be circulated, we are told, in all trade union branches in South Africa. I'd like to see it circulated in Yugoslavia as well, you know, in the different now component states of Yugoslavia. I'd like to see this text get translated, you know, uh, into your languages and discussed and so on. Um, I'd like to see small meetings, big meetings, meetings everywhere. People start to think, what is our next project? You know, we need to construct a project. It's not enough to be against the world we live in. We have to be for something. So let's come up with a project. This is a work in progress. It's a living document. Uh, we want it to be improved, to be challenged, to be put forward, to have more collective discussion uh, and so on and to, and to become a material force. You know, uh, Change doesn't happen by ideas alone. They happen when ideas become a material force. And so we are very interested in, uh, in reinvigorating the process that led to the new international economic order. And let's see if the plan to save the planet can have some legs. If, if it fails, let's see something else. But we need to have uh, a collective project in which we all believe, uh, which will give us the opportunity to become better people. Uh, you know, what would it mean for culture makers to discuss a project like this? There's a section on culture. It's so interesting, you know, and I'm going to end here. I talked about the meeting of the group of friends in defense of the UN Charter. Our section on culture um, in this text uh, opens with, um, you know, uh, this line, and I'll read it to you and, and I can end here. Promote the ideas of the UNESCO Constitution of 1945, particularly the idea that the wide diffusion of culture and education is indispensable for human dignity and world peace. How many of you have read the UNESCO um, Constitution of 1945. It's an incredible document. You know, we need to read it again. We need to circulate it. Uh, we don't always have to come up with new texts. Sometimes we have to take those older texts and we have to make them new. Uh, just as we have to say we are in defense of the UN Charter, it might be worthwhile saying we are in defense of the UNESCO Constitution.
Uh, Vijay, thank you once again for uh, this uh, amazing uh, lecture and very, very inspiring ending. Uh, I hope we see you uh, in person in Yugoslavia uh, soon. Uh, and I want to apologize for everyone who didn't have the chance to pose the question uh, online and here, but uh, we have um, to continue on with the sessions after the break. So, goodbye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye.
Okay, Spremans. Hello. Okay, we will uh, proceed with the first panel of this conference, and uh, our first panelist is uh, Vedra Nobuchina, who is a priest and academic researcher whose interest is in the field of religious diplomacy, religion and politics, faith-based diplomacy, and the peace building, peace studies, religious and political social semiotics, Iranian studies, and general religious studies. He's author of the book, Political System of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and he will have a talk about religious and cultural diplomacy of the Islamic Republic of Iran within the non-aligned movement. So, Vedran, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Um, and hello, everyone. So, it was very nice to be uh, presented uh, as, as a religious person so that you don't think I am Iranian Basij because they dress very similar to me. Um, yes, my topic would be today about uh, the diplomacy of Islamic Republic of Iran um, in, in the non-alignment movement. Um, and uh, Iran is basically latecomer in Nam because uh, uh, until Islamic Revolution in 1979, Iran was not part of this uh, of this uh, movement. Um, but after the Islamic Revolution, uh, Iran had to find a new way to connect to the world. And following Fred Halliday's historical sociology as a way to understand the Middle East foreign policy, Iran is. Islamic Republic of Iran uh, is a state whose international relations and process of its legitimacy rests upon ideology, which is very interesting in today's, in today's, um, oh, here it is, <laughs> in, in today's world, which is increasingly being void of um, known ideologies uh, from the past. According to the Iranian worldview, uh, rich countries with high level of development enjoy better global position and they misuse other countries where, uh, which are void of resources and make a huge gap and economic imbalance between rich and poor. Economic and political hegemony of such states includes also cultural hegemony and I think Vijay was talking about it very, very vividly today. Um, uh, that threats the history, culture, and identity of many countries. Um, when we look at the Iranian constitution, following the articles 152 and 154, uh, Iranian foreign policy cannot be seen as neutral, but non-aligned with the hegemonic powers, and considers the international organizations as best places for cooperation with other states. Thus, the Islamic Republic uh, became a member of non-aligned movement already in 1979, immediately after the, uh, the revolution, um, as the principles of mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, equality and mutual interest, non-aggression, mutual coexistence and non-interference in each other's internal affairs, which are basic uh, tenets of NAM, uh, were also constitutional values of the new Iran. Before that, Iran was in Sento Pact, led by American vision for the Middle East, for which the Shah Muhammad Reza Pahlavi was a great proponent and supporter. Only after the revolution did Nam accept Iranian foreign policy as eligible for membership. Um, in the words of the Cuban foreign minister Isidoro Malmierka, such Iranian inclination was even more accentuated through Iranian revolutionary motto, um, based on uh, self-perceived uniqueness of the Islamic Republic in the Cold War. So you could, after the Islamic Revolution, there was a lot of uh, new mottos coming out. One of them was very interesting, Nasharina Garbi Fagad Jumhuri Islami. Uh, so not East nor, nor West, only Islamic Republic. And this revolutionary uh, idea was based on ideologically driven foreign policy that included 
Estegbare Jahani, this is the global arrogance, animosity towards Israel and Arab monarchies, and I have to say about this global arrogance, Iranians still today have a day of, international day of global arrogance, which is celebrated uh, in a very uh, big uh, way in, in Tehran, and against uh, imperialist policies. At the time, um, four durable principles of Iranian foreign policy emerged. One, refuting all forms of foreign dominance. Two, keeping Iranian independence and territorial integrity. Three, defense of rights of all mus Muslims without entering in alliance with hegemonic powers. And four, fostering peaceful relations with all nonviolent countries. Iranian membership in Nam at the time, and in comparison to some other Muslim countries such as Petromonarchies, was thus ideological and not, not very pragmatic. I'm talking about the first years of the Islamic Republic. Also, none of the leaders, including Ruhollah Khomeini, did not offer clear understanding of why Iran wants to be a strong member of NAM. However, following Khomeini's remark on this topic, one may conclude that Iran joined the NAM because the organization refuted uh, both hegemonic blocs, so both Eastern and Western bloc. The problems of NAM countries in finding their place in the world after the Cold War were partially solved with the need for a trans-regional institution in an increasingly multipolar world, where NAM is also seen as a lever of pressure to the United Nations. Uh, in the final decade of the Cold War, Iran fought against Iraq in eight years long war and uh, also against increasing sanctions. Um, due to many disagreements and diverging attitudes, Nam did not condemn nor either Iraq or Iran in this, in this war. It didn't have any, any, any official standpoint. Also, numerous diplomatic activities were seen between the Nam member states uh, with Tehran and Baghdad. Only after the Cold War did Iranian diplomacy envision its full involvement in the NAM, and this proved beneficial for the Iranian government in its outreach to the world. In general, Iran considers its role in the movement as an important member that will not accept domination of any power in the world, and that will seek a return of organization to its original goals. This was uh, evident in NAM's similar position to some of the Iranian foreign policies, uh, common specific, uh, specific policies, of course, on the Palestinian issue, opposition to anti-religious movements and fight against racism, or demands uh, to the global north to be open for fair economic and political relations with the global south. Uh, Nam also did not pressure Iran to succumb to the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency, which is very, very uh, uh, important for Iran, as the organization is keen to stay away from political pressures. In fact, um, at the meeting in, uh, in, um, in Cuba, in Havana, in 2006, uh, the leaders of NAM uh, issued a special uh, separate statement uh, to, in support of Iranian peaceful nuclear activities. Um, A uh, proposed, um, proposed track to fight is to fight against world powers and encourage strong independence of nations with the task of respecting the human dignity. Iran's presidency of NAM in 2012 was seen in Tehran as an opportunity to increase cooperation and coordination of regional securities through an idea of global joint management, which became one of the strategic goals uh, of the Islamic Republic. And this envisions the global role of the movement in the national arena in order to achieve equal rights, realization of human ideals, and to overcome insecurity and discrimination. Iran is supportive of them as a sort of alternative to the contemporary global mechanisms in resolving international disputes and in developing peace, and foremost as an alternative to the United Nations Security Council or at least as an organization that will help in rethinking the goals and structure of the, 
of the Security Council. This is in lieu of what Vijay was talking today. Um, I would say that some feeling within Iran is not to uh, not to have too much uh, confidence in UN uh, restructuring. So they are much more supporting that NAM takes this place and not and not uh, waiting for the reform. Um, due to the increased sanctions against the Tehran government during the years, um, in in the time when uh, when uh, President Mohammad Khatami came to power in 1997, Iran went for Dialogue Among Civilizations program. And this was a broad program of exchanges in cultural, scientific and sports arenas, uh, which is basically the way how Iran conducted foreign policy in the world during the sanctions. Uh, this was primary, the cultural policy was the primary stepping out of the world. And it rested upon the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Leadership, one of the so-called three sovereign ministerial bodies, along with the Ministry of Information and the Ministry of Defense. This is due to the nature of the activity. So the Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Information do not, are not uh, uh, only uh, uh, below uh, the president. It's a presidential system of government, but these three ministries are not only under the president, they're also under the direct influence of the supreme leader. Uh, and all three of them have their own diplomatic corp. So they are not under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's very complicated. I don't want to go into this. In many ways, um, this ministry is key to the day-to-day -day operation of the ideological background of Islamic Republic, of the state idea, which is called Vela Faqih. Uh, it actually forms a set of media, ideological, charitable, tourist, cultural and religious worldview of the Islamic Republic of Iran. The Islamic Republic News Agency, culture and Islamic communication and media organizations, charities, the Islamic Tourism Organization, cultural associations, the Hajj and Pilgrimage Organization, the Cultural Heritage Organization and the Ministry have an obligation to promote ethical principles based on belief and piety, to spread Islamic culture and art, to inform the world about the foundations and desires of the Islamic revolution. Uh, it is the only ministry, as I said, besides the, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Defense, who has its own diplomatic service. And most of the uh, presidents, like Khatami and uh, Rouhani, they were before they were working in this ministry. So it is very, very important ministry. Um, it constitutes a set of uh, diplomats attached to the embassies of the Islamic Republic of Iran in the world who operate through the cultural centers of the Islamic Republic with a special budget and special tasks. Culture is considered as one of the most enduring components of national power and in catalyst in global relations and heads of state using cultural diplomacy and a strategy of so-called positive protectionism spends large sums of money to guide world public opinion in order to secure non-violent interests of the country. There were some criticism, especially in the last few years of the budget and efficiency similar centers, um, but it is believed that cultural diplomacy presents a positive image of Iran, of Islam and of Shiism among the educated, as well as neutralize negative effects on public opinion in the region and the world in various ways. In recent years, Iran recognized the potential of cyberspace and young generations to neutralize the activities of the enemy by producing useful culture content. And they have a lot of things that they are doing, especially in NAM countries, like uh, directing the cultural space of the country towards enhancing the level of public culture in coordination with Iranian Islamic country. This is very important to stress, not Iranian, country, uh, Iranian culture in, in its totality, but Iranian Islamic culture. And boosting cultural exports, especially in the West Asia region or the Middle East influencing the purposeful appropriation of culture credits to elites to improve native culture attractions. 
um, implementing policies consistent with the Supreme Leader's guidelines, uh, confronting cultural influence of Western countries, uh, and employing the capabilities of critics to neutralize enemies' activities, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this is basically a whole set of um, policies that are uh, in the field of soft diplomacy and soft policies um, uh, that are basically making a kind of war between the Iranian Islamic or Global South idea against the idea of um, McDonaldization of, of the world. The greatest uh, opportunity of Iran to appear and propose its policies for NAM were possible during the meeting of NAM in Tehran in 2012. Iran took over the presidency of the movement from Egypt, a country that only one year before had an uprising and had its first three elections. At this occasion, the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic, Ali Khamenei, gave a speech that outlined Iran's thoughts about modern NAM and place of Iran within it. He condemned the United Nations Security Council as an irrational, unjust, and utterly undemocratic structure, which abuses the mechanisms of the UN. He stressed the importance of non-proliferation treaty and confirmed the Islamic Republic will never produce nuclear weapons, but will also never relinquish its nation's right to peaceful use of nuclear energy. This is a policy whose motto, nuclear energy for all and nuclear weapons for none, echoes the idea of breaking the monopoly of global powers in producing the nuclear weapons. Khamenei also uh, reminded in, uh, uh, on the need to find real and just solutions for the Palestinian question, which is always part of Iranian foreign policy, and reminded that all solutions that have been made so far are not only hypocritical in terms that the world powers accept Palestinian rights for their state, uh, but do nothing for this cause. The controversial Iranian president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, accused directly the United States for expropriation of science and technology and the misuse of culture and identity in Africa and South America, destruction of families, sales of weapons, and escalation of hostilities. He also accused the Western powers for ignorance, monopolistic, selfish, and hegemonic behavior, and also attacked the methods and work of the UN Security Council. This was interesting to see. Uh, I was watching some old videos from this, uh, from this uh, meeting uh, because uh, all of this was said in presence of the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon who was there in Tehran. The meeting in Tehran has been, held, has been held by Iranian diplomacy as a great success and in particular Iranians were keen to present their role <coughs> in the way of Islamic awakening and developments in the Arab countries, particularly the crisis at that time in Syria and in Bahrain, which at the time, in 2012, there was not so many uh, uh, news. The Islamic Republic uh, sees itself as a model for a number of nations in Nam, as Iran demonstrates power in international media and strength against colonial bloc, which wants to isolate the country in the world arena. While these statements may be exaggeration, I completely agree with that, the Islamic Republic indeed sees the NAM as an organization that addresses the needs of the developing world and inequalities resulting from the current international political order. It uses the NAM platform to weaken the anti-Iranian climate in the international arena, <coughs> and there seems to exist a global NAM consensus about the validity of the Iranian claims. Um, interestingly, also many of these efforts were, could be seen uh, all the time in the neighboring or friendly countries in Asia, especially in Iraq, um, lately also in Pakistan, which is interesting, also Afghanistan. Um, Iranian diplomacy quite contrary oriented their tactics with Inam to the Latin American countries, mostly those that embraced leftist governments who, who are termed illiberal, such as Colombia, Venezuela, Uruguay, and Cuba. Sometimes also other countries. Such a condition is based on common perceptions of American politics in their respective regions. Additionally, Latin America has many potentials for Iranian government 
to foster new political and economic approaches. But sometimes they use revolutionary narratives to do so, to foster, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to, have, to make them even closer in terms of um, both, let's say, uh, colonialism in, in one's prosperous civilizations, but also, very interestingly, the role of the Catholic Church in, uh, in, in the Latin America uh, to which uh, Iran wants to express and stress the role of clergy in society, in particular the local levels, um, and also the resistance to the conditions of perceived neocolonialism. Such was the case with a uh, joint oil and gas venture between petrochemical industries of Venezuela and Iran, as well as interest Iran has in Roraima region in Guyana, considered to be the world's largest uranium si mine. Many Latin American countries support the Iranian nuclear program, and explicitly through NAM, such a notion was confirmed by Chile, Bolivia, Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. In conclusion, one may consider the Iranian approach to the NAM as pragmatic, but also ideological. And Iran found in NAM an excellent position to connect to the global south, particularly in times of massive sanctions that struck the country. Uh, it was foremost a platform for the religious revolutionary to present new political system in Iran at the time when Iran became the member of NAM. But after the death of Khomeini, it also became an organization which Iran perceived as a support mechanism for its policies, not only political and religious ones, but also economic and cultural. In many ways, Iran found a satisfactory answer to own worldview, but first and foremost for Iranian interest, in particular the influence on the UN and, uh, and in terms of the nuclear energy. As a latecomer, I would also arguably say that Iran unintentionally gave something to post-Cold War NAM II, and that is an, the idea that alternative to the global recognized system is still possible. So, I'm always, uh, I'm always very um, uh, stressed that I will, not that I will overdue my time, but I will, that I will not be up to the time. This strangely never happened, so I will stop here. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, we will. Uh, I would like to invite uh, George Loftus. Uh, and because we will have a presentation, <laughs> uh, presentations, and after all three presentations, we will have discussion. So, George Loftus is uh, currently MA student uh, with the Global History Program at Freie Universität Berlin. His research is part of the emerging tendency which seeks to approach Eastern European history through post colonial approaches. Uh, he's focusing on uh, late socialism and the role of non-alignment movement in Yugoslavia, political and uh, social uh, circumstances. And his research is questioning some of the assumptions of the life under self-management socialism. Today in presentation, uh, we will, uh, presentation is titled Islamic Internationalism Inside and Outside of Non-Aligned Movement, the Iranian Revolution in Bosnia. So, George, please. Thank you. All right, is this, is this working? All right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, thank you for, for uh, inviting me. I think this is a, a fantastic opportunity. I'm very excited uh, to talk to you guys about the uh, Islamic Revolution, or the Iranian Revolution, uh, and the responses to it in uh, in Bosnia uh, during the Yugoslav period. So, um, whilst my talk today is on the period 1979 to 1983, the more immediate reactions to the Iranian Revolution, um, I wanted to start in Sarajevo in 1996. Uh, this photo here um, is a shot from an AP report on the dismissal, uh, is he up there? No, that's me. Uh, on the dismissal of, oh yeah, sorry. Getting confused. Uh, on the dismissal of this man, uh, Hassan Cengic, who was in the cabinet, he was deputy defense minister. 
in the cabinet of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and he was dismissed in 1986 at the behest of the American government because of supposed links to Iran. Uh, Cengiz's removal from the position of Deputy Defense Minister um, also came at a time of wider engagement between uh, Bosnia and Iran during and after the war. This is well known, the connections between um, the Bosnian government and the Iranian government um, during and after the war. Um, but I want to skip back in time now to 1981. Cengiz was no stranger to the exact accusations made against him in 1986, having been accused of much the same by the Yugoslav state in 1983, along with future president Alija Izetbegovic. Uh, nor was he a stranger to transnational pan-Islamic interaction. As a stranger, uh, well, sorry, as an Islamic scholar, and member of the Yugoslav Islamic community 15 years earlier, here in 1981, Cengiz wrote this article on the meaning and significance of Sharia in some Muslim countries. In this article, Cengiz explains to readers how Sharia law is being interpreted in contemporary Muslim societies. It's also more about what Bosnian Muslim writers referred to as the time as the generalized, quote, Islamic awakening. Cengiz surveys the implementation of Sharia law across the Muslim world, with Iran being one of several countries which exhibit a growing, ten this is a quote, quote, a growing tendency to break with Western models and a determination to return to their own laws, culture, and civilization. Alongside Nimeri in Sudan and Zia ul Haq in Pakistan, Khomeini is quoted extensively in the article. The proclamation of the Islamic Republic is seen as the most representative moment of the strength of the new Muslim coalition alongside the 19 1973 oil embargo. For Cengiz, quote, Muslims have the space population, dynamism, strength, energy, and money, meaning there is no reason why they cannot become, quote, the master of tomorrow's world. This article and others from the Islamic press of Yugoslavia discussed openly the Islamic revolution in Iran, and in doing so revealed much about how non-alignment had come to shape their, quote, imagined community of global Islam. So what I want to uh, suggest today is that with poor knowledge and limited contact, the Yugoslavs relied on their existing conceptions of the world order and their place in it to interpret the events in Iran. These mental geographies were influenced by Yugoslavia's position as the European stronghold of the predominantly African and Asian non-aligned movement. I therefore argue that the Yugoslav reaction to the Iranian revolution cannot be divorced from Yugoslavia's specific position within the non-aligned world. Moreover, transnational connections between Muslims under the NAM umbrella formed what I call a shadow or accidental internationalism, taking the position of, quote, ideological stowaways. For Yugoslavia's Islamic community and its members, responses to the events in Iran um, were often contextualized in a larger Islamic world that they experienced through the infrastructures and networks of non-alignment. In these reactions, the Libyan, Sudanese, and Egyptian turns toward Islamism in the 1970s and 80s loom as large as Iran's Islamist rupture all these movements were seen as part of a, quote, new Islamic internationalism. This alternative world-making, which is evidenced in the responses to the Iranian revolution, uh, also tells us much about the place of religious bonds inside and outside of non-alignment. So this research uh, and paper I'm presenting is built out of the sources from the digital Ghazi Hudzav Beg library, which is a screenshot from here, um, using articles from Preparod, uh, the Glasnik Islamskat Zainitsa, uh, and the Islamska Misao, I've attempted to interpret through their reporting on the Iranian revolution a wider understanding of what you might call actually existing non-alignment, i.e. the daily experiences of a revolutionary organization in its period of institutionalization and stagnation. Despite Nam's effective collapse in the mid-1970s, the movement's inertia in the form of existing bilateral agreements and the socio-cultural experiences um, of international engagement was a significant force even into the post-Yugoslav period. Such an understanding cuts against some of the depictions of Islamic internationalism from in Bosnia being chronologically separated from non-alignment, a product of post-socialist freedom or of wartime radicalization. I've not attempted here to draw out a universal experience of the Iranian revolution uh, from Yugoslavia or Bosnia, rather, as these publications were based around the religious and intellectual life, my research speaks to the concerns and experiences of the Muslim, Bosnian Muslim intellectual elite is also crucially still a Bosnian Muslim, not Yugoslav Muslim story. Uh, the GHB library lacks Albanian language sources, uh, and I lack the ability to read them. Understanding the different experiences of Albanian and Bosnian Muslims of global Islam under Yugoslav socialism is definitely a significant area of future research. So I just want to talk briefly about um, some of the context that I'm working with here in the um, 
uh, historiography uh, and uh, wider academic field of contemporary studies of Yugoslavia. Uh, much of my interest in the topic comes from what I believe to be uh, a void in the literature concerning the history of Islam in Yugoslavia. This body of work has yet to deal extensively with the relationship between domestic and global Islamic practice under Yugoslav socialism. This is despite the fact that a half century under socialism saw the most sustained interaction between the Western Balkans and the Islamic world since Ottoman rule. Post-socialist transitions to religiosity can only be made sense of through the historic experiences and the socialism. Cengiz's journey from 1981 to 1986, I think, is instructive here. I've been most inspired and driven in this by Darrell Lee's work. Uh, his research on foreign jihadists in the Bosnian War seeks to eliminate many of the boundaries between religious and political internationalisms, arguing that Nam provided for Yugoslav Muslims, quote, a way of identifying with both the socialist state and the Ummah at once. It is this parallelism between NAM and other internationalisms that is my main interest. Throughout NAM, through NAM, crucially this is through NAM, not by or within NAM, a new Muslimness was beginning to be expressed. Uh, my research here is also greatly inspired by the work of Catherine Baker in Race in the Yugoslav region, in that it shows how global notions of identity, such as race or religion, operate within the strictly political mission of NAM. Uh, I'm also drawing on new trends in global history, for example, in Chemo Aden's book on the idea of Muslim world, which is an intellectual history of the origins of the idea of the Muslim world, historicizing what is often seen to be a traditional idea of the Ummah and placing it within a specific colonial and post-colonial context. And I'll go also Robert Vitalis' work on the origins of international relations, in which he argues that international relations owes much to white supremacist eugenicist beliefs um, in America in the early 1920s, and how these ideas of race and religion greatly modeled what the notion of the international community was. So on the question of uh, what I'm talking about when I talk about the idea of pan-Islamic internationalism, um, I see NAM here as an infrastructure for pan-Islamic internationalism. Extensive diplomatic and economic interactions between Yugoslavia and Muslim-majority post-colonial states form the basis for trans-regional interaction between Muslim Yugoslavs and their co-religionists in the Middle East and North Africa. Under Tito, Yugoslavia cultiv cultivated strong relationships with the Arab republics of Egypt, Libya, and Iraq, which led to an increasing presence of Arab Muslim students in urban centers and reciprocally Yugoslav technical workers in Arab states. The Yugoslav diplomatic service was also a common home for Muslim party members, as the expanding ties with Muslim-majority states increased the need for Muslim diplomats. This kind of official work also extended to the uh, IZ itself, as it often sent delegations of ulema to Muslim nations at the behest of the Yugoslav state. The interactions brought forth by the networks became central to how Yugoslav Muslims understood themselves. So here is some more cuttings from, uh, this is from Islamic Thought magazine. Um, and as you can see here, the author is uh, Ahmed Sekutore, Sekutore being the president of Guinea, that um, significant non-aligned nation in Africa. But what I want to emphasize here is that Islam as a belief and practice existed awkwardly amongst the expanding ties of non-alignment. Until Iran's entry into the organization in 1979, Muslim states that participated in NAM often did so in entirely secular capacities. This was not the case uh, only for nationalist regimes, such as Egypt and Iraq, but also for avowedly Islamic governments, such as Mauritania or even Saudi Arabia. Hostility to pan-Islamic politics in the movement from Yugoslavia and others meant that such tendencies was present were never part of official networks. Rather, these tendencies, particularly amongst Yugoslav Muslims, were, as I've said, ideological stowaways, using the established infrastructure of NAM to form their own transnational connections and systems of knowledge transfer. Such sub-networks, alongside certain kinds of official patronage, fed into Yugoslavia's domestic Islamic revival in the 1970s. Whilst these were eschewed from the main fora of NAM, these sub-networks were highly integrated into the official ones, a notable example being the writings of Ahmed Sekutore appearing in a Bosnian Muslim uh, journal. Uh, so I will move on to this question of the Iranian Revolution specifically now. Um, excuse me. Uh, so in the uh, press of the Islamic community, uh, the Iranian Revolution received two major features in Preparod magazine and a handful of coverage in other publications such as the Glasnik. None of the coverage was concerned with specific events in the revolution, nor did it feature original reporting. All these pieces were published between 1979 and 1981, and this cut-off in coverage coincides with the onset of the Iran-Iraq war and was connected to the parallel response of the Yugoslav state in the aftermath of the Iranian revolution, something itself that I think is deserving of a lot more research. But what I want to emphasize is that the fact that the Yugoslav, uh, and Bosnia specifically, um, actors here did not have any specific knowledge of the situation in Iran meant that they had to rely on the world making that had taken place, a parallel world making between 
Yugoslav Muslims and Muslims in other Muslim majority states operating through the infrastructure of non-alignment means that you have this kind of mental geography of global Islam that then allow that, that conditioned and uh, allowed them to process the Iranian revolution. Um, so one of the ways this comes through um, is in the major coverage of the Iranian Revolution um, in 1979. Uh, this is a quote from the clipping that you saw just earlier, um, the main feature entitled Iran and Islam. This article is in this feature oriented around what is referred to as the uh, Iranian miracle of Islam, uh, which is said to have been a, quote, phenomenon of modern history on a global scale. It's also understood as the, quote, natural progression of a much broader process of modern revival in the Islamic world. This contextualized understanding forms the basis of Prepera's coverage in this feature. Um, and then to dive into the sources more explicitly, we have this article from one Yelena Marincic, um, which is Allah is in fashion. Um, most deeply understood in articles such as this uh, was the possible geopolitical implications of the Iranian revolution. The expectations of the Iranian revolution for the world system formed the basis of an early debate over the revelation's implications in the Islamic press. On the 15th of April, 1979, Prepera's first major feature on the Iranian revolution it, it appeared earlier, Iran and Islam. Um, a subsection of this feature was this article by Yelena Marincic, um, who is actually not Muslim, but a writer for the um, Bel uh, a Serbian writer for uh, Nadalia Novosti, um, entitled Allah is in fashion. So here's a quote from the article, uh, and the article suggests the possibility of a, quote, worldwide geopolitical reversal. Marincic argues that in the aftermath of the revolution, quote, Muslims are united, and that an Islamic internationalism transcends national borders. Marincic sees the pan-Islamic trend, which was given new life by Iran, as a new opposition against the bipolar world order. Such understandings clearly draw on Yugoslavia's own claims to resistance against the bipolar world. Echoing Nam's turn towards the North-South conflict, Marincic's vision of the Islamic revolution here as a rebellion against the developed world, possibly owing to Marincic's non-Muslim status, the place of Yugoslavia in all these texts is highly ambiguous. It is unclear whether Yugoslavia is within or within out the developed world, and whether the Iranian awakening is a threat to Yugoslavia itself. The awakening of the Islamic bloc is celebrated in this article and others by Muslim writers, um, but the ambiguous, it is ambiguously connected to the lives of Yugoslav Muslims. The publishing of this Marincic article in the Muslim press speaks to some of the ambiguity that came along with the responses to the Iranian revolution. It's also notable as a month later, an Islamic writer challenged Marincic's view of this notion of fashion, Allah being in fashion, to describe the new pan-Islamic wave. This writer, credited simply as J.M., not the same author, strangely, accuses Marincic of reproducing, uh, re reproducing a, quote, ignorant attitude towards Islam in the Iranian constellation, accusing her of, this is a, quote, losing her mind. However, rather than disagreeing with Marincic's pre premise of an emerging Islamic internationalism, the writer agrees with this, but questions the idea of it as simply a fashion event. For J.M., assumed to be a member of the IZ or Ulema, Islam is a way of life which challenges modernist orthodoxy. J.M. also criticizes Marincic's view of the Iranian revolution as a, quote, dark cloud, instead suggesting that it is a sign of Islam's role and power in fighting modern alienation. Um, but more extensively, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, so more extensively, I guess I, I wanted to emphasize this work here by uh, Hussein Jozo, um, who I would go into his biography, which is very fascinating, but I won't. Um, so he served as basically a very influential figure in the Muslim community in Yugoslavia, and he was also highly integrated into NAM networks, uh, acting as a Yugoslav delegate to pan-Islamic conferences, and a translator for, uh, as a diplomatic and translator figure uh, in the Middle East. He also served as the editor of Preparod for some time. And he wrote this article about Khomeini and the Iranian Revolution, and he basically suggested this. He offered a position on the Iranian Revolution which can be counted as nothing but unqualified support. He said this, the particularity of the Islamic revolution is manifested in, among other things, the very small number of victims. It is certainly the cheapest revolution, and not a single in the revolution in the world would have killed so few of its opponents than this Islamic one in, the, in Iran. Uh, the European public are also highlighted as hypocrites, who demand from Khomeini that he pardons the Shah's regime and forgive the criminals who tortured the Iranian people. Uh, 
he also mentions his links to Musa al Sada, a Lebanese Shia cleric, and I believe that his connection to Shada is probably came about through an IZ delegation to Lebanon or Shia delegation to Yugoslavia. Um, I'm running slightly out of time here, so uh, hopefully we can get some of this stuff in the questions. But basically, I think what these are, um, articles evidence is that the connections that these Muslim figures were making, so Jozo, Cengic, um, various of the smaller actors, uh, they weren't making any connections to Yugoslavia, but rather they were simply drawing on the experiences of non-alignment and a parallel international Muslim transnational connection. Um, and they were using that to process the Iranian revolution as a kind of global event. And what you get is these very kind of strangely supportive visions of the Iranian revolution, and they're supportive because they highlight how the Iranian revolution is a, basically an attack on the bipolar world order, an attack on the developed world, a threat to the kind of materialist notions of the West. A lot of this stuff, um, I believe, is deeply connected to the experiences of, of non-alignment. Um, I'll finish there, but... Um, Obviously, we'll get to the questions later. My first panelist is Daniela Majstorovic. So, Daniela, please. Uh, uh, Daniela is professor of English linguistics and culture studies in the University of, of Banja Luka. And her research interest involve critical discourse, analyzes uh, critical theory, feminist theory, post and decolonial theory, and post Dayton Bosna. She published over 25 journal arti articles, co-authored several books, and authors several books. So, Daniela, uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It's really nice to see you here. Um, so, um, today, uh, my, my intention was to speak about what decolonizing a future in, um, in the peripheries, and especially in European peripheries, such as Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is a former uh, country of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, um, as a reading against the grain. So this is like you know, reading against the present post-socialist grain, whatever's happening right now. And this is why I'm reading history in a way that I do as a cultural studies scholar. Um, and to read uh, different historically materialist assemblages uh, or social formation, I do prefer the term assemblages because recently I've gone away from, from CDA towards affect and affect theory um, for the reasons that I explained in my book, Peripheral Selves, which is coming uh, out this November, hopefully. And also to, um, you know, to read these... Uh, uh, they, or, or, or these three assemblages um, as, uh, in, in, in a sense of freedom time, which is something that I borrow from uh, Gary uh, Wilder, which is a distinct time in political tense, but also um, uh, as uh, uh, my dear friend Paul Stubbs wrote, uh, uh, to read these conjunctures, uh, to kind of offer this, uh, offer, offer this uh, humble, uh, different way of looking at uh, how political uh, organizations can be made, remade, and uh, uh, to kind of strive for a more uh, ethical uh, approach to politics of what is to come. So, you know, with, with this said, I'm going to give uh, an introduction of how I read uh, post-colonial and decolonial on the example of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and then um, uh, I will speak about deeper coalitions or what is to be done, kind of in line what Vijay Prasad was talking about this morning. Um, and I don't know if I will um, <laughs> need more than 20 minutes for this, but... Let's see. Uh, so Bosnia and Herzegovina, as a former Yugoslav uh, Republic, has been termed the periphery of the periphery uh, after the notoriously brutal 92-95 war, in which socialist Yugoslavia was dismantled and which ushered us into post-socialism so post with theoretical and pro practical impasses in which peripheral selves in Europe struggles can be located and analyzed. The Yugoslav revolution and socialist modernity were at heart anti-colonial, and uh, Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was never an empire. Uh, this is something that I kind of uh, was, uh, in a way, contest I, I contested uh, Xavier Bugarel's uh, stance that 
Yugoslavia was an empire in a way. I mean, I disagree. Um, <clears throat> despite the uneven development of its republics and uneven internal republic relations sometimes being reflected in internal colonization. So I'm sure that somebody from Kosovo will have a different stance than somebody from Bosnia. So can we dismiss Yugoslav socialist modernity as another colonial project, as many decolonial scholars have done with Soviet socialism? Following and analyzing the trifecta of the women's anti-fascist front, the AFG or WAF or WAF, the proletarian struggles of the People's Liberation Army uh, and the non-aligned movement as interruptions and reading them against BNH's present day condition, um, I'd like to reflect on the overlaps and discontinuities as well as uh, the specific constituents of and conditions for Bosnia. Uh, I'm going to say sometimes Bosnia, but I mean Bosnia and Herzegovina, of course, uh, for Bosnia's peripherality in relation to its colonial past and the neo-colonial present. In contextualizing Yugoslav socialism, it seems inevitable that any examination of the relations between the decision-making factors in place since the 1992-95 war will have to be done on one eye, with one eye on the anti-fascist struggles of the World War II. The latter war of revolution, while the former of counter-revolution, they resulted in two very different versions of the modern Bosnian state, but they nevertheless ensured the continuity of its statehood. These wars constitute two events in Baduan terms when socially excluded groups like the communists and partisans of the early 1940s, or the Serbs, Croats, and Bosniaks of the early 1990s burst onto the scene, rupturing the previous status quo, meaning insurgent fascism and capitalist relations in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, or socialist self-management and brotherhood and unity in Sifriya. These new actors took over, brought about social change, and in their hijacking of the subsequent social relations, different and intertwined truths emerged as foundations of contemporary epistemes of new nationhoods. Yugoslav socialism drew moral legitimacy from the struggle against Nazism in World War II and was the foundation of the Socialist Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina within Sifriya. In 1943, Zavnobi, or in English, the State Anti-Fascist Council uh, for the National Liberation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, became the highest governing body of the anti-fascist movement in the country. It laid down the famous founding principle of the Socialist Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, namely that the country belonged to, and I quote, neither Serb nor Croats nor Muslims, but rather to Serbs and Croats and Muslims, which stood in stark opposition with the current ethno-territorial setup. Placing the Yugoslav or Bosnian case in this equation further complicates things as the revolutionary struggle of the People's Liberation Army for national liberation from Nazi Germany and domestic traitors during World War II was a prime example of anti-colonial struggle. This is something that uh, I took from Branimir Stojanovic uh, some 10 years ago in Tuzla when he spoke about the proletarian brigades as being a true original um, anti-colonial movement. Uh, and also another joke that I forgot to mention at the beginning that Bosnia, uh, actually the, the PLA was started by a bunch of uh, surrealists and Bosnian peasants. And maybe because I am, a, 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 I, I do be belong to Bosnian peasants um, through my family. I mean, I'm like third generation. <laughs> so I think I owe them this. Um, among its outcomes was the emancipation of women and an unprecedented increase in popular literacy made possible via, uh, via women's anti-fascist front. Yugoslav socialism brought a reconstitution of anti-capitalist relations by introducing the concept of socially owned property coupled with, with the ideology of brotherhood and unity. It experimented with radically egalitarian relations of self-management and played a key role in the establishment of NAM. All of these achievements were historical interruptions of the former Yugoslav and consequently Bosnia's colonial continuity. Reading Landscapes of Freedom, proposed by Aim Césaire and Leopold Sidar Senghor, Gary Wilder adds to the current debates about self-management, post-national politics, and planetary solidarity in freedom time, inviting us to analyze the temporal dimensions of political life today. Fighting against nationalism and capitalism in post-socialist Bosnia today means trying to salvage, as I quote, a freedom time as a distinct type of time in political tense required or enabled by decolonization. Can socialist and decolonial objectives be commensurable on the basis of this freedom time, and if so, under what terms? Whereas some scholars see international socialism's anti-colonialism as contributing to decolonization taken as a broad term, meaning riddance of colonial oppression, others argue that socialist modernity was also colonial. Different politics of location to borrow from Adrian Rich may be crucial in the procession of these two different types of understandings. 
Discussing postcoloniality as a human condition, which we have often no power of choosing, and decoloniality as an option, consciously chosen political, ethical, epistemic positionality as an entry point into agency, uh, Tlostanova argues that decolonial option has nothing to do with socialism and socialist modernity, which she equates with coloniality. And I quote, in both Western liberal and socialist versions of modernity slash coloniality are vectorial time and progressivist teleology, the absurdly rationalized management of knowledge and subjectivity, the sanctification of technological development, the cult of the future, and the dismissal of negatively marked tradition. Moreover, acknowledging the deeply unsettling work of decolonization, this is something that Tuck and Yang warn in uh, their famous paper, Decoloniality uh, is Not a Metaphor, um, Early Yugoslav socialism was about liberation as much as it was addressing colonial wounds. And I take this from Gloria Anzaldúa and Agnes Gaggi, which opened space for productive synergies to overthrow the Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian colonial legacy, including the Yugoslav royalist legacy as well, bring forward freedom via PLA, social care emancipatory politics via WAF, Brotherhood and Unity, the official superior state ideology beyond the essentialism of fake multiculturalism, as well as global interconnectivities via NAM. In being anti-colonial, socialism is not necessarily always decolonial, yet decolonial and anti-colonial struggles and goals have historically overlapped despite the differences in their theoretical, political, and contextual assumptions. Whereas historical analyses of their respective genealogies have been largely missing, I will try to unpack the entanglements of the anti-colonial socialist trajectories in the Yugoslav case, and by extension, Bosnian, pointing at possible nodal points for a dialogue with decolonial scholarship. Uh, I don't know if there is this uh, citation from Samir Amin. I mean, again, time is of issue here. But basically, uh, I just wanted to, to, to quickly uh, brush up our memory of how, of the bandung, which was mentioned several times, and to quote uh, this part from, from Amin, who says that, you know, in reaction to the first long crisis of historical capitalism, 1875 to 1950, the peoples of the periphery began to liberate themselves from the 1940s, 1970s, mobilizing themselves under the flags of socialism, Russia, China, Vietnam, Cuba, or of national liberation, associated to different degrees with progressive social reforms. They took paths to industrialization, hitherto forbidden by the domination of the old classic imperialism, forcing the latter to adjust to this first wave of independent initiatives of the peoples, nations, and states of the peripheries. From 1917, uh, 1917 sorry, to the time when the Bandung project ran out of steam and the collapse of Sovietism in 1990, these were the initiatives that dominated the scene." End of quote. Catherine Samari uh, goes so far as to extend the notion of decolonization outside the field of decolonial studies while foregrounding the need to fight against any remaining trace of neocolonialism in the relations between formerly or presently dependent or dominant countries. And I quote, Decolonial orientation can and should be integrated into a communist or orientation defined as being opposed to all forms of domination and exploitation. By pre-modifying the noun communism with the adjective decolonial, she urges us to revisit the October Revolution and the other revolutions of the short 20th century so as to better understand the non-aligned decolonial struggles is connected with Tito's partisan struggles emerging locally and bottom up on several fronts on the basis of a real socialist communist project. So basically, if you can just go, uh, how do I do this with the, yeah, just to, because uh, of the time, with errors, uh -huh. okay, basically here is, you know, here, here are the slides, basically, uh, on PLA, I uh, drew a lot from, uh, 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 you know, in terms of PLA or Narno Slobodlačka uh, Vojska from the recent book by Gal Kirn, uh, which I'm sure you've all heard of, uh, in which uh, Gal Kirn says that the proletarian brigades, guerrilla style movement, opened new horizons and nurtured revolutionary political subjectivity on a global scale. And they were formed uh, by the executive decision of the Central Committee in Supreme HQ. The first was formed in Rudo in Bosnia on December 22nd. And it had two goals, liberation and revolution. And I quote, to unify the people along the broadest possible lines, the unity thus forged being reflected in the People's Liberation Front. 
the policy of fratricidal war pursued by the forces of occupations and quislings was countered by the Communist Party's policy of brotherhood among all the peoples of Yugoslavia in the struggle against the common enemy. And it was a politically reliable multinational mobile force that wasn't really attached to any particular geographic area, especially the first proletarian brigade. Um, in terms of collective action, in terms of mobilization, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the partisan counter archive rights of the people's liberation struggle and later socialist spirit serves as, he says, the counter archival surplus and revolutionary remainder for the Benjaminesque history of the oppressed and another reason to learn from former anti-colonial efforts in future decolonial struggles. Uh, IAFG, real quick, or the WAF, whether women's struggles, uh, struggles of women in socialism were feminist or not, which is again another big debate, the, uh, the Nanette uh, Funk and Godsey debate uh, that, that appeared in the European Journal of Women's Studies. Um, really extend, there was this extensive uh, sort of <laughs> uh, writing back and forth of, of what, you know, whether we could read AFG as, as a feminist or not. And, I don't want to get into it, but what the WAF did uh, was the mass literacy campaigns. Uh, they they support. They were uh, supporting uh, the PLA. Uh, they women participated as rational troops. They uh, participated as frontline fighters. Um, uh, they addressed women's suffrage, right to divorce. All of that was happening in 1945. Uh, access to education. Uh, the way these things were handled uh, remain worthy of further reflection and something we can learn from today. Just to give you. Some some illustration of what uh, what what WAF's legacy uh, has been. If you look at the census data, this is from Dobrivojevic in 1939. Uh, where were women in Bosnia at the time, and what happened in 1951? How the the, the number of female workers rose to 90 percent. We can now say, for better or for worse, is still really one of uh, you know the, the, probably the the most uh, uh, one of the most important like. Uh, contributions to this legacy, basically. Uh, okay, uh, so where are we now? Uh, on, on NAM, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of talk about NAM. I really uh, don't want to get into too much detail here. Uh, again, reading against, reading against the grain. Um, also, I was going to talk briefly about women's emancipation, depatriarchal. Uh, we can we can speak about that in the later session or in Q and A because, uh, of course, we can argue what what was happening in the 40s in terms of this depatriarchalizing potential. Whether uh, we're supporting the repatriarchal uh, repatriarchalization thesis or not, whether uh, you know Yugoslav socialism brought modernity together with feminism or not. I mean, this is a part of a larger debate. I don't want to get into it. Uh, but in revisiting NAM and its afterlife, I really, I really want to quote Paul Stubbs here uh, from from this unpublished book because I think it's it helped me somehow, you know think these things through and and maybe find answers. why why do I find them so important? in this kind of archaeological uh, 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 digging of why these things matter so much and why is it that the present moment is so frustrating, like, like Vijay was saying, it's about urgencies and abominations, and sometimes I really feel these urgencies and abominations strongly. Um, in revisiting NAMS and its uh, uh, afterlives, uh, Sub's cultural historiography drawing from the archival research is a work, and I quote, of recovery, reframing, and remembering, a kind of conjunctural translation that does not suggest linear lessons to be learned, but rather a humble offering for a new, renewed internationalist ethics and politics of a man's theory, solidarity, a technique of negotiation, a strategy of survival, which is inseparable from further debates on socialism, communism, and decoloniality. Uh, following uh, World War II, unlike many other peripheries, now we come to the question of why, why all these things matter uh, to me and, and, and people who, who, who live in Bosnia. Um, Unlike many other peripheries, Socialist Yugoslavia, including Socialist Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, at least for a few decades, took the path of socialist, not capitalist modernity as a form of an alternative or peripheral modernity. This was strongly felt in Bosnia with the rise of housing, roads and railways, schools and hospitals appearing where there had been almost none. So the whole debate, the growth debate, debate cannot be similarly applied uh, to the center and the peripheries. Close to 50 years of relatively peaceful Yugoslav socialism nevertheless gave Bosnia uh, the infrastructure, industrialization, jobs, and a distinct culture 
having effects both in its social base and the superstructure. Uh, the country ceased to exist in 1992, for many of us, although some people will say 1999, when militant Serbo-Croatian nationalism, including other brewing nationalisms, couples with readily available munitions of war, dismantled Sofria, leaving Bosnia with a death toll of close to 100,000 war casualties and over 1.5 million diaspora, which is now course rising. The new ethnopolitical entrepreneurs benefited financially in every other way from ethnic nationalism and ethnic cleansing genocide. Others, those who lost everything during the war or those who could not accommodate these new identities in their exclusivities, becoming also losers in transitions, were not so lucky. Yet the transition itself has not been so smooth. The Sifuri is a lived experience, a state of mind, the figure of thought has remained an open wound that kept reappearing as a haunting, as a haunting apparition. Uh, the 1992-95 war seemed to have represented the symbolic death of the Yugoslav socialist legacy with international community's blessing. This rings especially true in light of the recent ruling of the Dutch Supreme Court about the Dutch troops' liability for the Srebrenica massac massacre. Moving away from the horizons of socially owned property and self-management to imperfect but real features of Yugoslav socialism, the 92-95 war in Bosnia and the transition of the country to a free market democracy, uh, economy and liberal democracy orchestrated by the international community and implemented by the local ethno-national elites have in fact produced not one but several peripheries in the former Yugoslav country and have have peripheralized its population in multiple ways. Uh, so, yeah, I'm running out of time, uh, but I just want to say a couple of other things. So I would say that ethno-nationalism and capital's hegemony eventually won out, and the mainstream political visions, with, which included post-war historical revisionisms of the socialist period, became a tool of the new hegemonic order, paving the way for the processes of privatization and deconstruction, uh, destruction, sorry, by the elites at the expense of most citizens. The Dayton Agreement brought peace to Bosnia, but has failed to deliver on the promise of being a mere transitional phase and has made possible the creation of the new elites, right-wing right -wing populists in the vein of Donald Trump, unabashed misogynists and ethnic nationalists came to power in Bosnia long before the most recent rise of the far right in the West been running the country with toxic political visions of ethnic segregation and purity, a dangerous racism without race, the quote Balibar, why immensely profiting off of such rhetoric. To speak about colonial wounds and post-colonial uh, coalitions, uh, again, I don't have much time, but I just wanted to, to say uh, a couple of things here. Uh, why are parallels of this kind useful? Not just as they critique developmentalism, Eurocentric forms of knowledge, gender equalities, racial hierarchies, and the cultural ideological processes that foster the subordination of the periphery in the capitalist world system. A decolonial approach that dissolves the anti-capitalist post-colonial dichotomy in post-socialist studies by locating simultaneous origins of capitalism and coloniality is a possible way out, but socialist horizons and histories must not be overlooked. In the light of the present struggles going on in Bosnia as a Balkan periphery, I see them as opening space for multiple heterogeneous, even conflictive pressures or logics foreshadowing future resistance, not as mere acts of restoration or nostalgia of the past. Uh, Stoller's, uh, Stoller's insist, two, two paragraphs and I'm done. Stoller's uh, and Stoller's uh, insistence on re-examining what constitutes contemporary colonial relations, what counts as an imperial pursuit, and which geopolitics rests on residual or reactivated imperial practices, urges us to further inquire into the relationship between the post-colonial, the decolonial, and the peripheral. These debates and their historical precepts continue to be relevant for the contemporary left, progressive internationalism, as well as for the more comprehensive anti-racist decolonization projects towards a no longer colonial future, making sure that, and I quote Ferreira de Silva, material and immaterial, presential and virtual expressions of solidarity multiply and last on the smoldering ashes of colonialism. If deep coalitions, to quote Maria Lugones, are ever to be established, recognition of the specificities of political subjects of decolonial struggles should not preclude dismissing other anti-colonial struggles, many of which have had socialist roots. Adopting a new vocabulary and grammars should not in any ways uh, divorce peripheral selves from future political struggles of which they might otherwise be agents, but should instead bring them toge together in solidarity and dialogue. Speaking of decolonial potentials and 
communist political horizons and seeing them as embedded within historical materialist conjunctures once made possible, we cannot afford to dismiss them as blueprints, as assemblages and blueprints open for reactivation. Perhaps only then can we salvage our freedom time that is to come only by striking back. Uh, can we heal our wounds in differentiated yet common uh, against global oppression? Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite yeah, Vedra and George to join us for discussion. First of all, I will ask you if you have questions to each other. <laughs> Maybe yeah, to start. Many. <laughs> many, okay, you will do it on a coffee, great. So if somebody from the audience have a question, Paul, please. Thanks, all three of you. If ever there was a demonstration of why conjunctural analysis is important, it was those three papers. So, so thanks ever so much for that. I, I have a couple of questions for George and a kind of dilemma for Daniela. And I think then for Vedran, the only question would actually be if you looked at Yugoslav sources, because there's clearly a, another story here as well. But George, I mean, brilliant, conceptually rich, incredible kind of play, working on this, and clearly you will do much more. Uh, so the footnote first, and Daniela did it better than me, just to kind of caution that you do need to first say, I'm going to talk about Bosnia, I'm going, I'm actually talking about Bosnia-Herzegovina, but I'm going to talk about Bosnia, because that, that actually is quite important in, in this audience, in a sense, but that, you know, that is a cheap footnote, really, in a sense. But so the three things, I mean, clearly, Yugoslav, Yugoslavia's involvement in the non-aligned movement was always about this complicated balancing between secularism and religiosity. There was real panic in the Yugoslav elites when the Islamic Council was formed, right? So, whereas, of course, Tito was actually, you know, did want to reach out to Latin American uh, liberation theologists, was happy to have the Vatican as observers. So I do think that what, what you're talking about here is a much more is part of a much bigger story about the complexities of the relationships between secularism and religiosity and whether we can even talk about those as binaries anymore, actually. And that brings you to Bosnia-Herzegovina, of course. Uh, the second point, and it's maybe, I may be wrong. I'm often wrong. Um, you seem to suggest there at one point that there was a lack of Yugoslav analytical capacity about what was going on, particularly around the Iranian Revolution. Now, I don't want to do the historians from my experience of the archives, but actually what's striking to me is actually the, the way in which Yugoslav analytical capacity was much better than much northern and western analytical capacity. So there was, you know, there, there was clearly an awareness of what was going on there. But the, the, the third point is really the most important one. Uh, is there another part of the story here, which is Iran and Iraq then become NAM members at the same time and yet have real problems with each other and how did that impact? But crucially, Libya. Libya and Gaddafi are crucial to this story, of course, and Gaddafi's complicated relationship to the non-aligned movement and eventually his kind of radical refusal of, of the non-aligned movement do seem to me to be bits of this. So it's just an encouragement, I think, to to kind of bring some other things back in. Daniela, thanks for assemblage. Um, um, that's, a, that's, that's a joke amongst the, the, uh, soci the sociologists and the art historians here. Um, and I did want to bring gender in because I think with Vijay, uh, his, book, his books are brilliant on gender and today he was actually ra largely silent on gender. But Vijay's analysis, certainly in the Darker Nations, was that, you know, there was, there was bourgeois feminism and nationalist feminism coexisting with a much more emancipatory feminism. And I just wonder whether that has resonances here. But the final point, I was actually deeply disappointed by, Verde, uh, by Catherine Verdery's book because the title is better than the book, uh, you know? Right, she does. But I just wonder whether... Just like with decolonial communism, we actually need to do much more on communist decoloniality. 
because I'm sick of this post-socialist literature which really only talks about Eastern Europe. And, you know, why Sarah Salem is so important tomorrow as a keynote is this trying to think through Egypt through Gramsci and Fanon, you know, how we can think through some of the people that even George quoted, you know, Secatore, and their relationship to different kinds of socialist and communist theory. Was there a question there, or was that a very long statement? Sorry, but uh, great papers, thank you. Well, uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, apologize for my uh, uh, mistake there. Um, I should have said Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and then I think, I think a lot of this is, um, I've certainly thought a lot about the things that you've brought up when I um, uh, was doing this research. I think this question of secularism and religiosity uh, and the panic over the place of religiosity in um, non-alignment, especially in... in uh, late Yugoslavia is, is a really important uh, part of the story. I mean, something that I didn't get to talk about, but like is, I guess, the, 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 the mirror of the thing that I was talking about is the way the Iranian Revolution was received in, by non-Muslims, especially by the Yugoslav state and party. Um, there's certainly a lot of use, uh, at least rhetorically, of the fear of Khomeinism, and like there's a, there's a quote from um, Hamdi Apozdarac, the leader of Bosnia at the time, uh, where he accuses some of the Alema of, appeal, of uh, following a Khomeini-style fundamentalism. Um, so th I, this fear, I think, is actually animated quite a lot by, by the Iranian Revolution. Um, so, I mean, I think this is, to me, a, a really important tension in the, in the last period of the Nolai movement, how religiosity really um, operates um, and how, it, how Yugoslav actors uh, begin to perceive it as, as undermining some of the... Um, some of the, the 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 kind of the structure of, of the, the the domestic, how the, the 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 this Islamic international, as as my Bosnian actors called it, might become a threat to, to the Yugoslavia like domestic scene. Um, and then um, I think as well that you, you you're probably right on this question of, of analytical capacity. I mean, it comes through in the sources that they have this um, quite complex position on the Iranian Revolution. I think it was to me reading it quite a surprising one. They obviously have a, uh, they're drawing from so many different places and positions. And I think something that, that is important to know that I didn't get to know is, is, is the, obviously the um, Bosnian Islamic tradition, uh, well, the Islamic tradition in Bosnia and Herzegovina um, that was followed by the Islamic community is, is quite complex and interesting and has this really important um, history and place within the um, earlier forms of Islamic internationalism in the interwar period. Um, so I think you, you, you're definitely right on this this question of analytical capacity, and I'd definitely be interested to see the or talk, hear about those sources that you've been working with. And then I guess this question of Iran and Iraq ties into that that first point that I that I may responded to you about this question of secularism and religiosity. There's this definitely this element of uh, geopolitics at play here, and um, Yugoslavia's uh, support for Iraq, sort of uh, complicated, slightly. Um, clandestine support for Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war colors some of the um, responses to the Iranian revolution um, and the close relationship between uh, Tito and his successors and Saddam Hussein obviously has this, this coloring effect. Uh, and then Libya is something that I'm not so uh, familiar with. I mean, obviously I know about some of the um, uh, some of the history of Libya, but like I've never really worked with, with Libya. But um, as a final point, I will mention there is something in the sources. Uh, one of the ones that I mentioned, uh, I think it was from uh, Cengic's piece that, that I mentioned at the beginning, is that um, he references, there's a very interesting thing that I can't quite pass yet, but he references how um, the Islamic communities, how Islamic countries are seeking to, I think he says, gain favors from um, either Libya or Saudi Arabia. So there's this kind of understanding of the shifting nature of what Islamist politics are about in a kind of geopolitical and uh, domestically political sense and how uh, countries like, um, uh, well, the Gulf countries certainly, but also just, I think even countries like Indonesia, the, 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 um, the shifting nature of power in the Islamic world has this shaping nature for Islamic internationalism generally. And then Yugoslavia's place in that, I think, for me, is still something that um, I'm, I'm figuring out. Yeah. 
I'm glad you brought that up because there's this whole, um, uh, you know, there's like three paragraphs where I write more about uh, what I mean by bringing these two things, the coloniality and communism, um, in, in a closer contact, perhaps. But, uh, you know, a, a lot of us have spoken about this kind of haunting apparition of Yugoslavia. What is it? And, and I'm sure there will be more papers uh, discussing it um, in the following days. Uh, but there is this revolutionary uh, communist surplus, you know, I mean, whether we are into psychoanalytic theory or not, but like this surplus somehow corresponds or is a mirror image of the absence of a socialist political horizon uh, which, which, which I find to be absent from a lot of work from many uh, post-colonial and decolonial thinkers focusing on Eastern Europe. Uh, for instance, uh, these pathways historically have been super complex and, and intertwined. Uh, and now some, I don't know, like I've spoken with some Polish uh, friends who, who, you know, who just consider all of that stuff spent and used and maybe, you know, there's no going. So the thing that's really big in Poland right now is uh, the so-called uh, post-dependence theory. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So, you know, instead of, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of grappling with how we call these things. Are these post-socialism? The famous uh, article by, um, uh, what's his name, Miller, a uh, scholar from uh, from Switzerland, it's like goodbye post-socialism, you know, why is post-socialism not adequate? Why, you know, post-dependence? Um, uh, Tlostanova speaks a lot about traumatic, of course, I've, I've been having some issues with, okay, of course, she talks about the USSR uh, style uh, socialism, I mean, Yugoslav experience is very different. Within, the, within Yugoslavia, there were different experiences if you were you know, using Bosnia and Herzegovina as an example, as opposed to Kosovo. Uh, I mean, I remember a long time ago in Belgrade, uh, like 10 years ago, there was a map of Yugoslavia, and it was Svetlana Slavšak and like all these lefties, progressives, and there was Albert Heta, you know, a Kosovo uh, artist who said, I want out, I don't want this. Like for him, it was traumatic. This is something Nita Luzzi is talking about. So, you know, a lot of people will have different, but then again, this post-dependence, I think we should, you know, stop thinking of communism as, as Germans say, Denkverbot. You know, it should be, again, brought into some sort of discussion and not just, uh, uh, you know, via relatively, I would say, weak theory so far, but really supported something that should be supported empirically, you know, through archival research, qualitative, quantitative, whatever, when possible. Um, yeah, what else did I want to say? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, this dependence, post-dependence, you know, of course, for the for most of the of, of the Eastern Bloc, uh, it was traumatic. But then for Yugoslavia, especially given what's happening right now, you know, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I don't know, you've heard this morning the news about Kosovo. There's potential, you know, we don't know if, <laughs> if a war is going to break out like the, today. Like, it's really, really tense. Um, and it's always tense. Like, you could say, oh, you know, in Bosnia, it's always tense. It's always these nationalists. But it's really, it's been pretty unbearable. Um, so, yeah, that's all I have to say. Um, regarding your first remark, I think uh, I think we should uh, we should uh, we should focus on different understanding of role of Islam in 20th century in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, especially after the downfall of Ottoman Empire, when there was a huge debate among the Bosnian Muslims which Islam to follow, what to do now in the new circumstances. And just today we were talking, just before this conference, Jelaludin Čaušević, who was the Reis of Lema in, um, after the Ottoman downfall, he, um, he opted for um, Isla, for the modernist movement, which doesn't mean that there wasn't any conservative leftovers. In fact, there were many. And because of the break uh, breakdown of this discussion, or well, there was also, I mean, of course, uh, the, the the political organization of Muslims in the 30s, uh, in the in the uh, of the um, Yugoslav Muslim organization, and uh, was also part of this process. But after the uh, Second World War and, and creation of communist Yugoslavia, basically all the madrasas were closed down except uh, Gazi Husrebek Madrasa in Sarajevo 
and only the Oriental Inst Institute uh, was the place where you could basically talk about the world Islam and the position of Muslims in Yugoslavia within that Islam, basically of Bosniak, M Bosnian Muslims. Um, uh, and uh, in, in, in midst of this, you have um, the influence of Muslim Brotherhood as a core internationalist Muslim movement. And then you have the revolution, which is, which is in Iran, which is extremely interesting for, for the Yugoslav authorities because it is not Islam. I, I, I'm, 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 I wrote it in my book even. It's not Islam, it is state-framed Islam. It is what the government says to you is Islam, that's it. And this is something that was even appealing to the Yugoslav authorities. On the other hand, you have the proto-SDA, which is today nationalist party, but SDA is basically internationalist Muslim organization. It is, it is based on the idea of Islamic internationalism, not on the, and that's why, among other, other things, the, the last, uh, we were just also talking about him, very interesting person, who is very often omitted in, uh, in this, in this um, discussions, is the last Yugoslav race, Jakub Selimovsky, who wasn't Bosniak, who wasn't Albanian, who is basically a Macedonian Muslim, and who promoted this internationalism that in, in the end was hijacked by, well, by the Begovic family. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you to all. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a time. I mean, it's such a bizarre thing, time, <laughs> but we don't have it anymore. <laughs> and uh, we need to go to lunch and be back here at half past three. Sorry, but I'm a scarce resource. <laughs>
Thank you. Okay, hi. Welcome back, everyone here in the in the audience in Rijeka. Welcome to all of you on Zoom. We're running a little late, uh, but it's within the bounds of academic responsibility, and we can, I think, carry on for the full hour and a half, so we have lots of chance for discussion. I'm not Branka Bencic, who has another appointment. I'm Paul Stubbs from Liverpool, but living in Zagreb. Sorry? <laughs> um, and it's my great pleasure to moderate this second panel called The Spatio-Temporalities of the Non-Aligned. And we have three presentations. Um, the first and the third are via Zoom. And the second is here in, in Rijeka. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker from Indonesia, Brigitta Isabella, who is affiliated with the self-organized research group based in Yogyakarta, Kunsi Studi Forum and Collective. She serves as a member of a translocal editorial collective of peer-reviewed journal, Southeast of Now, Directions in Contemporary and Modern Art. Her research revolves around questions of the politics of mobility and cosmopolitanism in art practices the making and unmaking of geopolitical aesthetics and the art history of transnational solidarity. And for the past five years, she's been looking at these topics through inquiring into the artistic exchanges of third world artists during the Cold War era and cultural diplomacy in the afterlives of the 1955 Bandung Conference, which is directly in the frame of our research project of which this workshop is a part. So I'm going to hand over to Brigitta. Her, her uh, presentation is Southern Times in 1995 and Beyond, Moments, Era, and Temporal Logic of Contemporary Art from Non-Aligned Countries Exhibition. Brigitta, I'm delighted that you're with us, and the floor is yours. Yes, um, thank you so much, Paul, for your, uh, for your introduction. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say shout out to Sanya and Liliana, who might be in the um, venue there. Yeah, they've um, just come back from coffee. Ah, okay. Hope you, hope you all have a good coffee. And it's uh, 8.44 now uh, at night in Yogyakarta, but I'm feeling really energized by the um, sessions, the PJ session, as well as the um, previous panel as well. So yeah, I'm just going to begin my presentation by sharing a screen. And yeah, here you go. Um, my presentation today will explore the temporal discourse of the exhibition of contemporary art of the non-aligned countries, which took place in Jakarta, Indonesia, 1995. I'm going to review the moment that the exhibition had created in Jakarta, the historical era that had shaped it when the exhibition was held in 1995, and the temporal logic that it proposes from the perspective of the Southern aesthetic. And I'm going to show you that um, focusing on the temporal elements in the history of Southern exhibition, in which the NAM exhibition is our case study today, is important both on a practical and theoretical level. That is both on the organization of exhibiting the South, as well as on the polemical idea of Southern contemporaneity. So I will begin with the practical thing, with the page five from the exhibition catalog, which explain the condition upon which the catalog was written and printed. You can read it here, I hope you can see it in the screen, and perhaps feel the mad contingencies that pro probably would feel relatable for some curators or organizers here like how some works and curatorial texts arrive late, just when the catalog had already been printed uh, or gone to the printer, and works that are arrived, but different from what were planned before. So these notes suggest trivial matters and are most likely overlooked if we rush through the main content of the catalog. But the notes can also be regarded as an important disclaimer because they indicate the serious limitation in organizing a large scale exhibition which has an ambitious objective. That is, I quote here, uh, the objective from the uh, catalog, to find a basis for observing contemporary arts through a north-south conceptual framework, starting with observing the development of contemporary art within the non-aligned countries that collectively represent the South. 
Now, before I'm going to discussing um, this matter, let me share with you a few details about the exhibition. So um, the exhibition featured 400 works from 42 countries out of 100 members of NAM at that time. So it was less than half participant. Um, it was accompanied by two-day seminar titled Unity in Diversity, taken from Indonesian national slogan, Bineka Tunggal Ika. And it was held in conjunction with the 40th years anniversary of 1955 Bandung Conference. And it was coincided with the Indonesian president's last year in his term as the Secretary General of NAM. This is the picture of the venue, uh, Galerie Nationale, in nine, uh, this was taken in 2020. But uh, in 1995, we, we don't have the Galerie Nationale yet. Uh, it was only um, planned at that time. And the exhibition was actually um, wanted to create a platform, exhibition platform that makes um, um, the NAM countries donate some artworks to the National Gallery. And um, the, the National Gallery itself was only established in 1998. And some of the artworks that were presented in the NAM exhibition are still in the collection of the National Gallery. Okay, so the means of obtaining the artworks was through formal diplomatic context. So the exhibition invitation was sent out by Indonesian government uh, to embassies of the NAM countries. The countries that accepted the invitation then appointed a national curator to choose artists that will participate. And alongside with this, um, an international curator board was established consisting of seven people and headed by Jim Supangkat from Indonesia, which you can see on the left. And as you see here, uh, these are the curators. And unfortunately, I still cannot find the photos and the detailed profile of Emmanuel Arinze. Although I found that he served as a director of a national museum in Nigeria and had wrote several books on postcolonial museum practice. Uh, meanwhile, Piedad Casas de Balesteros, the only female member in this board, um, is also still missing in my research, although I already tried to um, ask several artist friends from Colombia who could not let me anywhere um, to, to, to know her details. So Emmanuel Arinze was scheduled uh, for speaking at the NAM seminar, the Unity in Diversity seminar, but he made a last minute cancellation, thus we cannot find the trace of his thoughts in the seminar proceeding. Um, Piedad Casas de Balesteros, meanwhile, was present in Jakarta at that time, but curiously didn't, did not present any paper in the seminar, while the other curators are presenting their um, seminar. And um, her trace could only be found in the seminar discussion transcript, where in one session she asked why there's no discussion about Latin American artists, which uh, rather strange because she was part of the board, and I could only speculate that she didn't really have a chance to participate actively in designing the seminar program. And we have to remember in 1995, the main means of communication at the time was fax and not email like we comfortably use now today. But anyway, the role of the International Curatorial Board was actually quite limited. Um, they didn't have the authority to select artworks submitted by the national curators because they didn't want to impose a certain standard or turning the exhibition like a competition. So whatever works submitted by the national curator were accommodated and displayed, making the exhibition like a huge potluck party, which can be fun and chaotic at the same time. The chaotic one, I think, is also in part due to the contingency that the small note on page five describes. So from the diversity, if not the arbitrariness of hundreds of works that arrive in Jakarta on time, um, the board observed the look, the look of those artworks, which are mainly painting, and then created five thematic display um, that were claimed to come from Southern perspective. These are the um, uh, thematic display, which I will explain briefly to you later. But um, the exhibition's openness was in line with the crowd curatorial boards claim that they, they wanted to avoid, I quote here, using normative standards drawn from the north, end of quote. But at the same time, they did not propose the idea of the South as a fixed and ready for use alternative standard. The South was quite simply something that was north, and in a more complicated way, it was something that is still being searched. 
I found that this exhibition logo that you see here, um, which looks like a stormy eye or a burning sun or a new archipelagic territory, captures very well this dynamic spirit of collective observation and collective searching of the South in the exhibition. Now I'm going to take you very briefly uh, flipping through the catalog pages and the five display themes. The first one um, was confrontation, qu uh, questions and quests, which interrogates the hegemony of Northern modernity and progress. Uh, second one was tradition slash convention, which claims how Southern contemporary art uh, is connected to the continuity of traditional art and against the simple division of tradition and modernity. Um, sign, symbol, script. Um, 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 this one is uh, claiming the relationship between spirituality and southern politics of culture. This theme consists mainly with Chinese calligraphy and Islamic calligraphic and geometric work. Um, the fourth one, the body, which rehearsed a, crit a critique against Cartesian dualism of mind and body. And the last one, um, is space, land, and mankind, which referencing to indigenous cosmologies and environmental issues in south um, in the southern countries. And what I just said uh, are not coming from my reading of the artworks, which are you know 400, 400 works, but just a brief summary of the description written by the board. And um, from 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 here by now, I hope you get the main main idea of the exhibition and its curatorial um, organization. And I wanted now to um, return to the problem of, of contingencies and um, talk about things that arrive late and those who fail to attend on schedule because I think these are the things that may complicate what seemingly a boring storyline. So two decades after the non-aligned exhibition, Nada Beros, uh, then the national curator for Croatia in the exhibition, wrote an essay um, on questions which didn't receive enough time to be problematized in Jakarta, 1995. Beros, uh, Beros essay titled Gorgona in Jakarta was commissioned for the Southern Constellation, an, an important exhibition which departed from Boyana Piskur's long research on non-aligned cultural movement and I noticed that um, in Rijeka, there's also the reiteration of, the, uh, of this exhibition, which sounds really great, and I hope I can see it, actually. Um, but anyway, in her retrospective text, uh, Bero said that the invitation from Jakarta was a grand idea, as well as politically ambiguous, because it didn't provide a thematic explanation or shared departing point which can be responded to. But she was still interested to take part because she saw that participating in the NAM exhibition could enable, I quote here, a small scale but very important intervention, end of quote. The NAM exhibition provided her an alternative geopolitical framework in a time where she observed that everyone from the state, the mainstream media, and the artists were all trying to prove that Croatia is part of the Western Europe after the end of Cold War. So Bero selected works from the former members of Gorgona, which I assume most of you are more familiar with than me, actually. Um, she said that the anti-political stance of Gorgona can be read as a non-aligned gesture. But when she saw the exhibition in Jakarta, she was a bit surprised with the puzzling presentations of the works that she sent by to Jakarta. For example, there is an installation work of Ivan Kozarik, a member of Gorgona, um, which is a ready-made object from the artist studio and it was labeled as sculpture in the in the in the exhibition um, um, label and displayed rather out of context under the tradition slash convention category although um, you can see here another work that was exhibited in the NAM exhibition um, a Duro Seder's painting titled the widow uh, in 1991 for Beros, she, she was quite satis satisfied with the placement or the categorization of this work, um, which, uh, which Beros describes as a highly gestural and expressive painting. And it was placed under the section confrontation, questions, and quests, which she, which she thought um, the most strong section in the, in the exhibition. 
And Bero said that um, the lack of context was due to the grand scale of the exhibition itself, which he thought has made it impossible for contextualization. And I totally agree with her. But to be fair, I think the note on the page five, which I uh, show you earlier, was also a disclaimer that realized the risk of misrecognition and misunderstanding in the exhibition. Now, I'm going to stop the share screen um, because I don't have um, any other picture to show. But um, I want to continue by um, reconnecting, realigning, and remediating a gap of the historical of the lack of historical intimacy that were present in Jakarta in 1995, which we came to know thanks to Bera's reflection and discourse commission. I'm not trying to act like I'm justifying the improper organization of the non-exhibition at the time, but I want to reciprocate Bera's reflection and opening up a possibility of contemporary reconnection as we all hear reassessing together the political and cultural legacy of NAM where mutual misunderstanding and misrecognition is, unde is unde undeniably part of that legacy. So I want to explain or explore the era or the economic and political conjuncture which surrounded the NAM exhibition in 1995 and what it means for Indonesian context in connection to the global South politics shortly after the end of the Cold War. So the non-exhibition was held under the patronage of President Suharto, who was a military dictator and who consolidated his power by com committing an anti-communist mass killing with estimate of 500,000 to 1 million victims. The North-South framework was a justification for the Indonesian government to subscribe to the US-led foreign aid economy. In his presidency, Indonesia became very open to foreign investment and it builds its economy through international debt. Thus, the North-South framework was, interpret was interpreted by the government as a means for G2G collaboration in neoliberal economic terms. And certainly, um, there was a contradiction in the way the international board defies the idea of the South as a refusal to comply to Northern standard of modernity and modernism in art. But the exhibition's progressive idea of the South could pass, could pass through because the Indonesian government under Suharto didn't really care about the actual art as long as it was not explicitly subversive. Um, so the government just want to make it like a big show of event. And like Beros, like Nada Beros, the curatorial board was actually also creating a very important intervention, although eventually both of them miss each other context and struggles. For Jim Supangkat and TK Sabapati, they were both uh, the members of the board. The South in the NAM exhibition can be seen as an attempt to mitigate radical post-colonial ideas and legacy of alternative internationalism of, third world, of the Third World, which, which was established by the Bandung Conference in 19, 1955, in the time when the Indonesian President Sukarno was very much a left-leaning leader. So in a way, advocating the idea of the South in Indonesia at that time is also a critique to Indonesian government's alignment to neoliberal ideology of developmentalism, which has devastated our traditional agricultural practices as, um, as well as the well-being of indigenous people. So that was the political graffiti of um, South in the exhibition at that time. And by saying this, um, I think the mutual misunderstanding and misrecognition in 1995 actually show us one discursive axis that remain important today in exploring the links and tension between anti-colonial hopes and anti-communist tragedy in the historical diversity of the NAM countries. As memories of making and unmaking of NAM cultural network continue to linger, to linger until today, mutual misunderstanding that happened in 1995 could be remediated by thinking through the historical connection between post-colonial and post-socialist discourse. Such discourse, which I think has been more and more discussed uh, today in academic setting, such as the wonderful um, presentation by Daniela just earlier, uh, may expand our horizon of imaginations of Global South cultural and political alignment today. Now, um, the last point that I'm going to make here will be about the temporal logic of the South. 
propounded by one of the most important thinkers at the NAM exhibition who were present uh, a paper in the in the unity unity in diversity seminar um, her name is Gita Kapoor an art theorist and curator from India so if we look at most of the paper at the unity in the and in diversity seminar in general the thinkers were gravitating in the post-colonial reassessment of the hierarchy between tradition and modernity it's quite a typical post-colonial discourse that came from a shared experience of colonialism. And in the 90s, this type of discourse had been consolidated in regional meetings between Asian and Southeast Asian and Southeast Asian artists and curators through platform founded by ASEAN, Japan Foundation, or Australian sponsorship. But unfortunately, there were little to no opportunities to deepen cultural network with the with the NAM or the Bandung map, such as the African, uh, Latin America, and the other side of Europe, for example, with Yugoslavia. So the NAM exhibition then was an important step, although unfortunately, um, there was no meaningful follow-up after that. Nada Beros even complained that she didn't receive the um, 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 post-exhibition catalog. Even the artist also didn't receive it. And I just uh, came to know that actually the hundreds of copies of the exhibition catalog was still stored in the Gallery National uh, up, and, up until now. So um, I don't know, maybe they don't, they don't have the budget or they were too lazy. But anyway, uh, despite this failure, I found that the main discussion in the seminar at that time had proposed an important critique against the manner in which tradition, so-called tradition, was exploited by national identity politics, which focused on state patriarchal ideology, as well as through self-orientalizing gesture by artists who commodifies traditional art styles to meet the expectation of Western uh, audience. Apinan Poshyananda, curator from um, Thailand, called this type of art uh, as a Southern comfort art which he criticized in the seminar. So going back to Gita Kapoor, um, for her, in order to mitigate the transformative potential of the so-called traditional art from the postmodern cliches about cultural difference and apolitical a a relativity, traditional or local art expressions need to be rejuvenated with a polemical strength, not just in order to interrogate the universalism of Northern modernity and modernism, but also to suggest an alternative future of the South. She believes that the politics of traditions can coexist with socialist avant-gardism. And as such, translating this temporal logic of the South into an agenda, we are not only interested in the excavation of tradition or this phase of nostalgia that Vijay reminds us before, but also committing to the effort to fight for a socialist future which can overcome the north-south economic divide. This polemical strength also needs to be enacted both across um, local and global spaces through transnational solidar solidarity from below so that we may escape the narrow identity politics of neoliberal multiculturalism or ethno-nationalism, which we also discuss, which promoted by the national state elites for their, uh, for their interests. So such agenda to collectively create productive polemical strength within NAM cultural network beyond the nation state elite identity politics requires us to deepen our cultural intimacy and political conviviality in order to remediate the gap of historical misrecognition and misunderstanding between global, sub, uh, between global South subjects and, and to realign our contemporary forms of solidarity. And that said, um, our encounter today, which I feel very privileged to be part of, is a promising step to further the creative and polemical strength of our transnational dialogues. Thank you so much. I hope uh, the time is okay. Brigitte, thank you so much for this combination of a forensic case study, a reflexive turn via Nada Beros and Gorgona, and then a, a genuine conjunctural political economy and the plea at the end is beautiful so thank you so much we'll come back at the end for questions and discussions but i'd like to invite the second the second speaker anna kanejevic please uh, anna has joined us from belgrade she 
She is an art historian and curator of the Museum of African Art in Belgrade. She's a PhD student of museology and heritology in the Faculty of Philosophy in Belgrade. As a curator in the Museum of African Art, she was part of the curatorial team for several exhibitions. She's currently a PhD student of museology and heritology and is working on two websites originating from the exhibition projects such as Unprotected Witness and Non-Aligned World. She's interested in museology and heritology, the culture of remembrance, media studies, film and architecture. And it's one of those lovely moments that when you submitted the abstract, this, <laughs> this website wasn't actually live and now it is. So yes. I'm handing over to Anna for her presentation, Nesvestani Tochka Rusa, a heritological experiment in mapping non-aligned monuments and marks. Anna. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak about the uh, Museum of African Arts in Belgrade um, project. I will speak about the uh, website, nesvestani.rs, meaning non-aligned point rs, uh, as an um, experiment in mapping. But, of course, uh, first of all, I want to show you uh, the whole project of the Museum of African Art made uh, this year and named Non-Aligned World. Actually, we did uh, this project to celebrate and uh, to dedicate actually this exhibition, but of course also a website to the 60 years um, of the first conference of Non-Aligned Movement in Belgrade. So uh, this is a good uh, photo for starts, I think, because it's interesting to me that the visual identity of our exhibition, even logo and this globe or, or dome you uh, can see is actually simil similar to your <laughs> visual identity of um, this event. So it is interesting that we have um, similar uh, associations when we speak about um, non-aligned movement and non-aligned uh, world. Here you can see a few more scenes, but of course I will explain uh, just for a second. I have to say that curatorial team of the exhibition is here on the photo and you can see uh, my dear colleagues, uh, Emilia Epstein, senior curator from the Museum of African Art, Milica Naumov, also curator in the Museum of African Art, and Nemanja Radonic from the Institute for Recent History of Serbia. Uh, I'm glad to mention that the uh, day after the exhibition opening, uh, exhibition was opened on September, on 1st September, actually exactly on the date when the first conference of non-aligned movement in Belgrade started. So day after the opening, we had this forum or conference named uh, NAM Talks, and it is available for you on YouTube channel of the, on, of the Museum of African Art, where you can see uh, our uh, stories and discussions. Um, we decided to make, make this non-aligned world, and actually it was a challenge to make exhibition dedicated to this subject. Why? Because a lot of, uh, of exhibitions dedicated to the first conference, uh, conference of non-aligned movement already happened in uh, Belgrade especially, so it was uh, <laughs> a challenge to make something new, how to say. So we decided to make a combination of uh, photographs mostly and archival material and actually to uh, change approach. Um, if you go to a museum or maybe if you pay attention here, you will see that there are no high politicians actually. We wanted to show not up-bottom approach, but bottom-up approach and in a sense how a non-aligned idea uh, was lived in Yugoslavia in that moment. So because of it we have this um, word, world, in a sense when we see origin and etymology, for example here you can see Anglo-Saxon Anglo origin where this word means age of a man and in a sense as experience or maybe something um, when, when we speak about everyday life. For example, I have just two scenes here, but there are a lot of scenes and photographs in the exhibition. Uh, here you can see workers at the Dome of Siam in Belgrade and their preparation of Belgrade for the first conference of non-aligned movement. And uh, other uh, photograph is actually from Biggs, Belgrade Graphic Institute, and the workers having strike on February 14, in 1961 and it was a, a big protest in Belgrade uh, because of the murder of Patrice Lumumba, first premier 
uh, of uh, independent Congo. Uh, there are different scenes. I uh, wanted to show you this one. Uh, it's also this protest on February 14th of 1961 and actually this is something we wanted to show how non-aligned idea could be lived or actually was lived in um, everyday life. Of course students <laughs> they were in the first plan. Here you can see uh, students uh, in Belgrade also uh, but uh, they are calling people for the big meeting dedicated to uh, actually protest because of Vietnam War in 60s. So our non-aligned world is actually made of these uh, scenes and um, we have, how to say, um, segments. We named it uh, non-aligned world uh, uh, is lived and fought for, non-aligned world is built and labored for, and of course <laughs> I'm coming to a website actually story, non-aligned world is uh, remembered and uh, safeguarded. So um, we could just think about etymology of the world world. Uh, when we speak about Greek and Latin, for example, it's an orderly, orderly arrangement or something clear and elegant. And actually, we thought about museum <laughs> as uh, some place where you have to make classification, you have to make museum grid or network, as you can see here. But because uh, our dome, our globe is actually a small one, I think maybe five or five or six people could enter the dome in the same time. So. I like to call this also museum cage. Why cage? Because it's a kind of a game, you know, when you work in the museum, um, you have to do this process of classification and of course there are some risks when you do uh, that kind of um, uh, stuff. So uh, here is a scene, uh, just part of this monument dedicated to non-aligned movement and this was inspiration. It's an old idea from Giulio Camillo and his idea of theater of memory. Actually we were inspired by this uh, structure where you can see he uh, said actually uh, that um, uh, from this structure we can uh, see inside the human mind or memory. So in that sense we made uh, this globe or dome, but of course there is also a historical reason. Another photo from Archive of Yugoslavia, you can see is actually part of the exhibition dedicated to non-aligned countries in uh, 1961 in Belgrade. And <laughs> to mention just third uh, association with our dome, uh, Museum of African Art also has a dome and I will speak about that dome uh, later. Uh, so, um <coughs> When we made this exhibition and when we had a lot of uh, material, as you saw some uh, really selected photographs dedicated to students and people's activism, and when we saw monuments, uh, especially today in Belgrade, as my dear colleague Emily Epstein from the museum noticed, uh, we saw that monuments are at, um, mostly dead or at least alive, how to say. Here you can see uh, just three examples. And the examples. One of them is obelisk at uh, Brankos Bridge in Belgrade and it was built uh, for the first conference of non-aligned movement. Another is a newspaper's article from um, 1989 which is the year of ninth conference of non-aligned movement in Belgrade and actually this is a concern about Museum of African Art and its death. I will speak about it when I mention Museum's Dome. And finally the third one um, is a mural uh, at Students Cultural Center uh, made of an um, artistic brigade named Salvador Allende from Chile together with Yugoslav students in 1977 but today it's in um, really damaged and ruined uh, condition. So our memory cage, <laughs> museum cage, actually, actually discovered to us memory problem or maybe that culture of uh, oblivion uh, is integral integral part of culture of uh, remembrance. Um, website you will see <laughs> at the end of this presentation, but I have to mention it because there is a very clear uh, classification of monuments, but not just monuments, not, not just monument by intention or in a literal sense, but also different city marks or just, you know, some um, some objects 
who could be related to non-aligned movement directly or in a close way, but also in a distant way. Uh, we made that classification, but for this occasion, I decided to name di differently uh, uh, these uh, objects. For example, here you can see short life of non-aligned uh, monuments. Um, there are um, three of them and uh, they don't exist <laughs> today. Uh, this one, uh, let me see just how this works. No, aha, uh -huh. this one is, uh, <laughs> it is also an obelisk, but made of textile, just for the first, aha, uh -huh. okay, here, sorry. <laughs> Okay, yeah, this one uh, is obelisk uh, made for the first conference of non-aligned movement on today's uh, Nikola Pašić Square, but in that time a square of Marx and Engels. And um, it is interesting uh, that this monument has uh, really dynamic life, but just in a few days, because it was made of textile and it was the first object in Belgrade with neon lightning system. Uh, this one is triangle named uh, Equality, Peace and Independence, and it was placed in Dedinje. Actually, all of these monuments, they were meant to be temporary monuments, to be um, removed after the conference, but they were in places where uh, um, um, uh, country delegates could uh, come and see them. And uh, this one is uh <coughs> near Mostar, or Belgrade Graphic Institute, BIGS, uh, and it's also dedicated to the first uh, conference of non-aligned movement. It is interesting to me that uh, non-aligned movement, or <laughs> Tito and Yugoslavia in, uh, uh, in this case, wanted to make temporary monument. You know, when you make a monument, it's something which should last uh, 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 for several years or time, but th these were temporary monuments, and actually I could not uh, say uh, for sure why uh, is this so. Maybe economic situation was something uh, related to this, but um, actually I think maybe they wanted to move them around the non-aligned world, actually around the cities where the conferences were held, because uh, you have in Lusaka, in Zambia, very similar monument to this one even today, and I'm glad that our map, uh, which has mostly Belgrade, actually has one pin in Lusaka, Zamb Zambia, and I think uh, we should start mapping uh, <coughs> worldwide, uh, NAM <laughs> worldwide, actually, in the future. Uh, accidental life, why? Here you can see this famous uh, obelisk, uh, he actually, uh, this, mo this monument was built also as temporary monument, but uh, it survived all the time and in 1989 when Belgrade was the host again, it was renovated and here you can see fresh, fresh news, uh, they are uh <coughs> renovating it now in, in the moment because Belgrade is again host of uh, the Conference of Non-Aligned Movements. Strange Life, I already mentioned the museum's uh, dome. Actually, this is interior of the Museum of African uh, Arts dome. And actually, it is interesting that this dome was built in 1989 when, when Belgrade was the host of ninth uh, Conference of Non-Aligned Movement. Actually, there are um, oral histories and stories that uh, the conference should be organized in the museum, but as they worked uh, really quickly, they uh, actually didn't finish it. And even today, we are expecting reconstruction of this space. Again, mural, uh, you saw maybe uh, at the beginning of the story of the website, uh, dedicated to Yugoslav solidarity with the people of Latin America. Uh, and actually this is action of Darinka Popmitic, contemporary artist from Belgrade, and she did this uh, artistic action in uh, 2005, named on Solidarity, and actually she tried to make reconstruction of this, this mural, but mural is so ruined that she concluded that we cannot make full reconstruction even uh, today. Again, a lot of presents from Yugoslavia, uh, happened in 1989, 
the year when Belgrade for the uh, second time was a host of uh, non-aligned movement conference. And what is strange life of this monument here, this is a present from Skopje and Macedonia to Belgrade and this is a uh, condition today. It's actually in Belgrade Art Hotel uh, Hall. Uh, but it was an um, official present uh, of Macedonia and it was in Knez Mihailova street on a prominent uh, place. Uh, Park of Friendship is maybe the most famous non-aligned monument in Belgrade and when we speak about um, these monuments uh, <coughs> uh, which were built to be temporary monuments, it is interesting to me that we have uh, nature, you know, trees as symbols of uh, peace and growing monument dedicated um, to uh, this non-aligned value uh, to peace. <laughs> and again, when you see uh, really soon a uh, website and our table on the website, uh, <laughs> mute life, but uh, th these are all parts of website. When you go to website, you will see all of this stuff I'm speaking about, but I just want to make a point. Mute life, you will see a lot of gray pins because we have pins in colors and we have gray pins. When you see gray pin, uh, that means that um, object is in this non-aligned uh, sense that. Um, it means that uh, we cannot um, connect uh, it with non-aligned movement and for example here we have uh, um, street names in Belgrade. For example, there was a street dedicated to the name of Ho Chi Minh or maybe to Haile Selassie, but today, uh, not today, but from 1992, they are changed. We have, of course, streets, for example, to dedicated to Nehru or Agostino Neto, which are still there, but this is something um, mute, <laughs> how to say, or uh, that. Uh, here, this is a mural um, on Yugoslav um, uh, theater in Belgrade, also ruined uh, during reconstruction, but it was made for the ninth conference of non-aligned movement. Gifts of Yugoslav cities, uh, there were a lot, but uh, um, a lot of them today, they don't have um, a plate or some explanation where you can see that they are related to this subject. Uh, here, this is a present from Osijek and the cities of Dalmatia to Belgrade for this occasion. And this is a present from Bosnia and Herzegovina, mural by Ibrahim uh, Ljubovic in the center um, of Belgrade. But today they are there, but you know, we forgot actually about their connection to non-aligned movement. And finally, simple and distant life. I wanted to name it um, a simple because when you have monument, it is expected to have <laughs> explanation or, or for the um, viewers to be clear um, what are uh, the purpose of these monuments. So here you can see, for example, um, memorial to Agostino Neto in his street in New Belgrade, uh, which is interesting because this monument is from 2010. So we tried on our website to map uh, different periods, not just this related to 1961 or 89, but uh, <coughs> in some periods between them or after them. Uh, here this is a sculpture dedicated to Nehru, also in his street. Belgrade has a student's dorm named Patris Lumumba and this is inside um, that student's dorm. This is an um, official present of the city of Aranjelovac, also for the ninth conference of non-aligned movement. And the street of, um, uh, dedicated to the name of Martin Luther King. This is just part of this map and actually um, when you uh, see the website, <laughs> finally, here you can see um, that we have uh, Belgrade and Lusaka in Zambia and then there is a key to understand this map. As I mentioned already, you will see gray pins and this means that each gray pin, for example, with a star, it's related to first conference, but uh, we don't know how, we, we forgot it's lost and similar, or it's related to the ninth conference, and again, it's working if uh, the pin is uh, green, but if it's gray, uh, it's uh, not so clear. And we have additional pins, 
you can see everything uh, in detail on the website. Uh, of course, the point is not just to have Belgrade. Belgrade is, as we hope, just starting point. And uh, today here, I wanted to invite all of you to make contribution or to participate by marking non-aligned, not just monuments, but different non-aligned objects in your uh, countries and cities. And uh, to make a conclusion, this map um, actually um, aims to, when you see it in distant reading, to show you health condition of these objects and monuments. For example, here you can see a lot of them are actually gray, so it means that in non-aligned sense, they are mute today in um, Belgrade. But uh, when we have close reading, then you have different stories. When you enter each pin, you can read about all of this stuff. And I mentioned some of them, but you will see uh, more on website. I will finish with this anchor. Uh, in the garden of the Museum of African Art, and uh, um, it's actually also part of our project of Non-Aligned World, because uh, for this occasion um, we translated and put it back, this uh, plate you can see here, because this plate has one uh, really important message related to Non-Aligned Movement, but also to the Museum of African Art, because it says uh, Yugoslav people never participated in human trafficking, because Anchor is um, related to this uh, slavery ships from Africa to um, America, so Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Pečar, uh, founders of the Museum of African Art, wanted to point out this anti-colonial uh, approach and politics uh, <coughs> of Yugoslavia and non-aligned uh, movement. I hope <laughs> I did it on time. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much, Anna, for that incredibly um, fascinating overview of the landmarks and finally the website um, and I think we can put Philodramatica as a temporary pin uh, for the for the for the website um, let us continue with our third speaker and it's very much continuing this politics of memory and remembrance um, Mila Turelic is an independent filmmaker in Belgrade and in Paris where she's speaking to us from She's an award-winning director. Her films have been screened at many festivals uh, and released the the theatrically in Europe. First film was Cinema Comunisto. The second film, The Other Side of Everything, in 2017, was H HBO Europe's first co-production with Serbia. Mila is a graduate of the London School of Economics. She teaches documentary and creative, creative use of archives at Sciences Po and Inasup in Paris. And most interestingly for all of us, Mila is currently in post-production on her third feature film, The Labudovic Reels, which she describes as an archival road trip through the archives of African liberation movements of the 50s and 60s, filmed by Stef Stevan Labudovic, the cameraman of Yugoslav President Tito. Um, Mila, thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I look forward to this presentation as we all do, and, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm really sorry not to be there with everyone, and but I am really honored to be coming after Anna's presentation because I really want to salute the work that they did on that exhibition. I just think it's a fantastic project to keep it going via the via the website. I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to sh hear the sound as well. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so my presentation actually starts uh, 10 years ago, not 60 years ago, because during the summer of 2011, I was granted authorization by the Serbian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to film the celebrations of the 50th anniversary of the Belgrade Conference of the Non-Aligned Countries. And my interest in filming the commemoration stemmed from research that I was doing into the filmed archives of the 1961 summit. I was interested in tracing the continuities and the ruptures between the two moments and investigating the way that the differences in their mediated narratives spoke to a half century of political upheavals. However, 
from where I was filming, what felt like a narrative appropriation driven by political ambition was playing out because at that time, um, Serbian Foreign Minister Vuk Jeremic had launched his candidacy for the position of Secretary General of the United Nations. And it might be the reason why I was struggling during those um, several conference days to make sense of how to capture the event in a meaningful way. And it's only after two days of what is the what you could call the filmic equivalent of treading water um, that it came to my attention that the Museum of Yugoslavia, which as everyone I think knows houses Tito's grave, had extended its working hours late into the night in order to accommodate the desires of various guests to visit the grave. And uh, in the atrium of the House of Flowers, where Tito's grave is positioned center stage, an entire side wall had been covered with the iconic photograph of the leaders assembled at the 1961 Belgrade summit. And stretching across this five meter wall were aligned bodies of the non-aligned leaders larger than life, a visual vigil standing guard over Tito's tomb. And the visiting guests were lingering in front of it. And I have to point out that you can see Anna Slazovic here, who is with us on Zoom and who'll be presenting tomorrow, but just as a way to salute my colleagues who have been so dedicated to working on this topic for such a long time. The visitors were posing for photos at the side of these leaders, taking selfies in the contentious shadows of their elders. And to me, the camera's flashes were the embodiment of Walter Benjamin's metaphor of a memory flashing up through spatial imagery. For Benjamin, the image that flashes up from the ruin or in the midst of the ruin is the source of remembrance, acting as a historical relay between the revolutionary past and the revolutionary action of the present. On one hand, it's a moment. On the other hand, it's a historical era in a moment. And to take Benjamin's concept further, if the 1961 non-aligned summit crystallizes into an image, it can emerge as an era. It can become understood or apprehended against the oblivion into which such events dissolve. And for Benjamin, this collusion or collision of temporalities becomes something he calls a constellation. And yet while it was clear to me that the visiting guests had deeply connected with the photo, it was harder for me to discern whether they were apprehending the image of a legacy or in fact, the legacy of an image. I was left with the question of whether the substance of the non-aligned legacy today, surfacing in this apparition of an image, revealed something of its essential nature as a vector of political thought. And as Benjamin's notion of resurfacing debris felt like the appropriate metaphor in my research of the visual archives of the non-aligned summit, it also pushed me to commit to the gesture of organizing this visual debris into new constellations. And this is where I would really like to echo Vijay Prashad's keynote from this morning, where he was kind of entreating us not to look at the past with nostalgia, but really as material from which to build a new political future, which is something that I've been trying to do with these archives. So for this process too, Benjamin has an appropriate metaphor. And likening the search for memory to excavation, he notes that an archaeologist who simply digs up the earth to get at artifacts without carefully noting the layers of earth from which they have been excavated would be throwing away the true subject of inquiry. And so Benjamin argues that true memory requires us to recall an event, not just in the context of its own layer, but also in the context of all of the layers that we had to dig through in order to get to it. And the metaphorical soil in which the sounds and moving images of the first non-aligned summit are buried are the archives of the Yugoslav newsreels, Filmske Novosti, which is the material you're seeing right now. Filmske Novosti were the institution charged by the government to film the event and produce a series of documentary films about it. I set about viewing the archives filmed by Filmske Novosti cameraman at non-aligned summits by starting with the one in 1961. And in the days after the first summit, Filmske Novosti edited and released several films. And you can see here a list of the material that they had filmed at the 1961 summit, starting from a report in the weekly newsreels, then a three-part special edition called the Belgrade Conference, and then a 10-minute color film shot by Stevan Lavudovic called the Historic Conference in Belgrade. But also Filmske Novosti records indicated the existence of an additional 36 reels of outtakes from the conference in black and white. 
But a physical search of their depot unearthed only 24 such reels. Marked PO for positive ostats, your positive remains. This was footage that was developed onto positive 35 millimeter film, but ultimately unused in any of these edited films. And so the 24 reels are thus a kind of haphazard assembly of outtakes slapped together without any order. And in June 2020, with Jovana Kesic, the head of Filmski Novosti's film archive, who you just saw in the footage, we undertook to view and inventory these shots, digitizing the majority for a research project that we had started in collaboration with Filmski Novosti, titled Non-Aligned Newsreels. And the fortnight of viewing and scanning allowed us to create a precise list of content. On eight of the reels were extracts from speeches, but silent footage, while well, 16 were jumbled bits and pieces of conference proceedings, the operations of the press center and delegates extracurricular activities. And what became striking as we organized these digitized outtakes was both the media presence at the conference and the way that the cameramen who were filming it had chosen to focus on that media presence in a way making a kind of meta um, behind the scenes filmed document if you like of their own presence. And this begins with the very first um, filmed a news report, the one that was premiered on August 31st in cinemas in Yugoslavia, which is to say the day before the conference opened. And so what I've done is I've um, subtitled that for you. Beograd, grad za maćin konferencije van blokovskih zemalja, pripremljen je da dočeka učesnike istorijskog skupa. sharing the sound as well. But just to say that when the Belgrade summit began the next day on September 1st, the Prime Minister of Burma, Unu, declared that the conference was important because, and I quote, the whole world has its eyes on Belgrade today. Around 850 journalists from international press outlets and news agencies were accredited for the conference. And, and as you could see in this newsreel report, these cutting edge technologies were shown to Yugoslav audiences, not only setting up the media importance of the event, half of the news report is essentially dedicated to what is the media infrastructure for the conference, but it's also, it also serves at the same time to underscore Yugoslavia's modernity. And so in order to understand the way that political decision-making had created the media infrastructure for the conference, I decided to expand my research to documents held in the archives of Yugoslavia notably in the funds of the Secretariat of Information and the Cabinet of the President of the Republic. And these reveal that the filming of the summit was of paramount political importance, as you can see on this document of the organizing committee, authorizing a sum of money to purchase transmission equipment necessary for the television station in order to set up what would be the first live broadcast of Yugoslav television, but also for Films Novosti to import the film stock that they needed and to purchase two additional cameras. And so ultimately, this leads me to one of my favorite quotes um, from a scholar who's been working a lot on non-aligned media, on non-aligned summits as media events, who is Jürgen Dinkel, and something that he wrote saying, lacking hard power in military or economic terms, the non-aligned countries try to achieve their foreign policy aims through increasingly symbolic performative actions, such as summitry, visual propaganda geared towards a global mass media to influence an assumed world opinion and make their voice heard in international politics. 
Another scholar who has been working pretty much on a similar topic in her analysis of the Bandung Conference of 1955, Naoko Shimazu, argues that the value of a conference like Bandung in, 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 her, in, in her case lies essentially with the symbolic, especially, and this is a quote, as it produced few tangible results. And Shimazu concludes that to understand the symbolic legacy, one needs to analyze the success of Bandung as a theater of diplomatic performance. Using her conceptual framework of diplomacy as theater, I would extend that argument to suggest that in Belgrade, it is through an examination of how that performance was oriented towards and represented in the media that is central to its symbolic legacy. For Naoko Shimazu, in addition to the stage, the two other constitutive components of diplomatic theater experience are the performers and the audience. And one sees in the filmed archives of the Belgrade summit that the performers, in this case, both the delegates themselves and Belgraders, were more than aware of their roles. And in his analysis of the event, Dinkel points out that many of the attending leaders ruled over states that in 1961 had only been independent for a few months and saw the conference as a chance to present themselves as rulers and assert their legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis both their own population and other states. And so here you see a selection from these digitized outtakes that haven't been seen or used in any of the films, can always see films, in which the media presence is kind of heavily accented by the cameramen who are filming the event. And again, to underline all this footage uh, that we found as outtakes is silent. It's the, only the images that have been preserved. Now the outtakes of the film material include interesting moments in which the cameraman chose to focus on the media consumption of the performers and in, in effect closing the circle as they become the audience of their own performance. So here you saw first um, President Sukarno watching the broadcast of the conference in the Salon of the National Parliament where the conference was taking place, but then Prime Minister Nehru reading a press report on his speech in the Daily Herald in the plenary hall of the national parliament where he had given his speech the previous day. So Jürgen Dinkel's argument leads to a striking conclusion, which is that the lasting symbolic meaning of the conference survives through and thanks to its visuality. In some ways, the media image of the event achieves a lasting legacy as it ascends to the iconic but at the same time, this serves to distance it further from its factual basis. Ultimately, its iconic meaning supersedes its indexical value, creating slippages. And I'd like to give you an example of what I mean by this. As I enlarged my research on the filmed archives of the Belgrade Summit beyond the holdings that are kept in Belgrade, an interesting pattern began to emerge. I obtained newsreel reports on the summit from France, Ina and Gaumont Pate, Germany, the Bundesarchiv, the UK, British Pate, the Netherlands, the Sight and Sound Institute, Russia, the State Archives of Russia, Cuba, India, Films Division, and the United States, NBC and NARA. And in comparing the reports, with some notable exceptions, it became obvious that for the large part, the filmed images being used were primarily coming from pooled footage, that is to say, footage shot by Filmsky Novosti that had then been circulated via the press center and after the summit. And what was striking was that the same images were being used to illustrate wildly divergent and ideologically opposed voiceover narratives, depending on the country the newsreel was created in. Hence, there were the same images of the conference plenary session in which we see close-up shots of delegates listening to speeches. The Russian newsreel spoke of an important gathering for world peace, whereas the French voiceover, is something that I'm gonna let you discover by yourselves. So again, I've subtitled the clip 
This is the report from Gaumont Papier, the French uh, newsreels on the Belgrade summit. Le tiers monde, les nations dites non engagées, réunies à Belgrade sous la houlette du maréchal Tito. Mais quel maçon sera capable de cimenter ce troisième bloc et d'en faire un véritable arbitre entre les deux eaux Le discours inaugural du maréchal Tito a été écouté par un héros réservé, un nasser distant, un soucarno attentif, un aïlé célestier lointain, un ensemble de soucieux, tandis qu'en toile de fond se dessinait le nouveau champignon atomique soviétique dont l'explosion n'a pu tirer ce délégué de sa somnolence. So in direct opposition to the adage that the picture is worth a thousand words, this is an illustration of the picture being open to a thousand interpretations. As the technology of the time meant that filmed image was recorded separately from sound, the destiny of these images was such that sound was archived separately in separate archives. And in the sense, the images became divorced from their original meaning and victim to imposed interpretations via battling voiceovers. And so for me, the challenge was to see if I could reconstitute the images and the sounds announced at the Belgrade summit by obtaining the remaining sound recordings of the summit in the archives of Radio Belgrade, today Serbian Radio Television and Croatian Radio Television. And then I start to synchronize them with the eight reels of speeches that I had found among the outtake reels in Filmski Malmoski. And it was a process that was rendered complicated by the fact that sound and image record, first of all, at different speeds. So it requires short segments to be synchronized at a time, but also because the speeches were in different languages, French, English, Arabic. And ultimately, with the help of a deaf mute agency in the UK, whose collaborators are experienced lip readers, um, and by working with Arab editors and translators, we managed to synchronize almost all of the film footage of the speeches that exist in the Positivo Stati, most notably large parts of the speeches of Tito, Sukarno, Nasser, and smaller segments of the speeches of Nehru, Nkrumah, and Keita. And a fragment of this work is currently on display um, thanks to curator Boana Pishkor and the um, team at Rugomore at the exhibition that was opened on Friday. But again, I'm going to share it here with you if we have an additional four minutes of time. We have an additional two, Mila, but go ahead. <laughs> Alfabetskim redom učesnike konferencije Afganistan, Alžir, Kambodža, Selon, Kuba, Kipar, Etiopija, Ghana, Gvineja, Indija, Indonezija, Irak, Liban, Mali, Maroko, 
Nepal, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Sudan, Tunis, Vedina Arabska Republika, Yemen, Yugoslavia. We come from Europe, we come from Asia, we come from Africa, we come from Latin America. Our peoples are different in many ways. Our cultures differ, our forms of state differ, and so do our political systems. But in an essential way, we do not differ. And that is in our determination to implement a new order in the world, which is based upon independence, abiding peace, social justice. We do not differ in our determination to have the freedom to be free. Our purpose here is to contribute relentlessly to the struggle against the rights of colonialism and imperialism. To build new nationhoods, not only to, to build a new world, to build the world anew. Uh, thank you for your time. Super, Mila. Thank you as ever. I can report that no one was asleep or worried. Um, it is still September 2021, and across the hall is uh, our other parts of your film. We we are running a bit late, but we can stay a bit later. So we have 20 to 25 minutes. Anna, come back and join me if, if you would be so kind. Brigitte and Mila are via Zoom. And I think what I'll try and do is collect some questions. So be clear who you want to address. And can I be a bit, uh, what's the word, transgressive and see, is there anyone on Zoom? that wants to ask a question or has put a question in the chat. There's nobody. I'll give them a minute, though, if somebody wants to be the first. They tell me when things are online that short silences seem much longer, but... I should tell you, Mila, that when I look to my right, it looks like your studio in Paris. There's like people beavering away on computers, but there's nothing from Zoom at the moment. Don't be shy. Let's go to the room then. Who wants to be first? At the back, Sasha. I think there's a microphone coming your way. Oh, no, there isn't a microphone coming your way. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Sasha Slachek from the Faculty of Social Sciences uh, from Ljubljana. I have a question uh, to Anna. Well, first of all, I, I really love the project you're doing with the, with the mapping of uh, the monuments. And I'm wondering, how are you moving forward in expanding uh, the map? Uh, so is it like uh, through crowdfunding, you know, so people, individual people can contribute or collaboration with institutions? So I'm wondering, how are you continuing the project and expanding it? I think that's a really simple question that can be simply answered. Of course. Uh, well, um, on the website there is a part named NAM Worldwide and there is instruction how you can participate. And uh, actually everybody is invited to just fill this um, paper because we already uh, defined what do, what do we need, the GPS coordinates and then we need some kind of um, you know explanation about uh, monument or uh, city mark um, and I would like to see from Ljubljana or any other city marks and just to mention because I did not mention uh, this but 
these uh, gifts of Yugoslav cities and parts of Yugoslavia in 1989, actually they have an um, interesting story about Ljubljana and Zagreb because uh, as I um, saw in newspapers, uh, Ljubljana uh, wanted to send some kind of um, replica or reconstruction of Loise Dolinar sculpture for uh, one uh, big building in Belgrade, but uh, this did not happen as well as a present from Zagreb also did not happen. They planned to make a Matos on the bench, Matos na Klupi sculpture, but it did not happen. And I mean, this is interesting because we can read the uh, relations within Yugoslavia in 1989. So I w just wanted to add this, but if I answered your, your question, you can just uh, participate by making this uh, paper and sending to us. We explained everything in English and we are doing translation of all of this, Mark, because we did it in Serbian for now, but translation in English is in progress. Thanks, Anna. The, there is a question in, in the chat from Natasha Kovacevic. Hi, Natasha. It's familiar, you can probably see it, but for the benefit of the people here, I'll read it. It's also a pretty straightforward question, so I think you can answer it straight away. If the NAM newsreels are being digitized, will they be available for public viewing at some point, or at least to researchers? And Natasha's referring to the Filmski Novosti work, Mila. So um, that's uh, not an easy question to answer. We attempted uh, to have something happen now for the 60th anniversary celebrations. We put together a project with Filmski Novosti, which we submitted to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in order to organize a public viewing of the work that we've done so far. They were absolutely uninterested in, in the gesture, um, which I think also speaks a lot to the political climate under which these 60th anniversary celebrations are taking place. Um, but because this is not what we are doing, particularly what I've been doing, is not purely using Filmski Novosti archives, because I'm also resourcing sound archives from many different sources in order to try and make these this footage speak. Um, I'm truly hoping that there will be a way to make it available for public viewing, but we're still in the very early stages of the project and also still fundraising in order to be able to achieve the whole project. So, but yes, ultimately, obviously, the whole goal of digitizing is in order, is in order to make it publicly accessible. But if I can, if I can piggyback on onto that question, the Labudovich Reels documentary. When can we? When can we expect that? I blame Corona for this. I have no idea when we well, we lost more than a year because of the fact that festivals had gone offline, but we're hoping that it'll premiere at the beginning of next year in a physical screening. Super, thanks. Some more questions. I, I now can see the Zoom room and some of my friends, some of our friends here, but let's, who, who, who else wants to ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, hello, uh, I'm uh, George Loftus. Uh, I'm from the Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, and it's actually another question for Anna. Um, I'm just curious about um, whether you've been able to gauge the um, responses to the exhibition and how um, visitors have the, especially the way you've sort of spatially organized it, I think is, is, is very fascinating. And how this is, I mean, it, it hasn't been open very long, so I guess the, the, the responses have not come in so fast yet. But I guess, is there like an expectation you have for how you expect the visitors to, re to respond and engage with it? And have you seen anything so far about how they're engaging with it and engaging with this kind of aspect of, of Serbian and Yugoslav history? Okay, so uh, the question is related just to exhibition, not to website, right? If I understood. So exhibition was opened on the, uh, September the 1st, so it's just how many, <laughs> 20 or something uh, days. But for example, Mila, <laughs> who is with us in uh, this session, uh, came to us when we were preparing exhibition, day before opening. And for example, <laughs> as I saw, she was delighted. I mean... <laughs> Uh, um, I mean, it's it's <laughs> okay. 
No. <laughs> okay. But uh, for now, um, I mean, I can uh, speak about impressions in a museum book of impressions because there are a few uh, nice uh, comments. But uh, um, as we had guided tours and, of course, the whole curatorial team um, as well as uh, myself, I can say that... Um, People actually uh, love this approach, you know, dedicated to everyday life and, how to say, ordinary people. Because, uh, as I said at the beginning, um, a lot of exhibitions um, happened dedicated to non-aligned movement and, of course, for, uh, dedicated to the first conference of non-aligned movement, but um, n not a lot of them pay the attention, you know, to, for example, uh, journalists, translators, workers. Some scenes we saw in um, uh, these movies, these videos, are actually on the exhibition, but in pho photograph. Uh, uh, in photo format. So, um, as we can say in this <laughs> moment, I think people uh, think that it's, you know, interesting exhibition and, of course, this approach with the dome. And I did not mention, because the time is alway, always short, but outside this dome, maybe you saw on the photograph of the exhibition, there are uh, six or seven um, really huge banners because we wanted to um, remember uh, these protests, of course, but uh, this, how to say, street poetics and aesthetics. And on these banners, we actually wanted to point out keywords uh, from non-aligned movement and non-aligned idea. And uh, these are anti-racism, anti anti-colonialism, equality, peace, solidarity, uh, and cooperation. So we illustrated it, of course, with historical facts and uh, photographs, but I think also people react on, you know, this kind of a very powerful but also clear approach to uh, these concepts and values at the end. So I hope I answered <laughs> your question. Super, thank you. We still have five minutes, Lily. Also, a question for Anna. I just wanted to ask: Have you contacted perhaps the institutions or city um, um, councils of the cities that were also hosting the uh, NAM conferences after the raid, in, in, in an attempt perhaps to 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 define your network, to broaden your network of the um, marks and the memories on? Okay, in this moment, no, because this is just, uh, this is, uh, how to say, Museum of African Arts project exhibition plus uh, this website. Uh, and for now, we started with Belgrade and we have a um, collaborator in Lusaka in Zambia. She's a photographer and she, uh, her name is Svetlana Ducinovic and she made this pin for a monument in Lusaka in Zambia. But after our, for example, conference and forum in Museum of African Art, uh, we actually uh, ha had the contact with one uh, colleague and researcher and she wants to pin all these um, economic uh, cooperations between Yugoslav, um, how to say, fabrics and f firms uh, with African countries. So I hope in the future we will mark this kind of uh, information, but uh, maybe to connect with Sasha's uh, question, this is, you know, project on, on good <laughs> will, how to say. So we explained everything and we gave instructions and this uh, paper, you, you, you should uh, uh, feel if you want to mark uh, something, but it's uh, for now on this uh, basis, but it's a good idea. We can actually send email or <laughs> something to our colleagues um, uh, in these cities. So I'm thinking about uh, uh, that side of affective memories mm -hmm. on, on the NAM. And I recently just read one um, uh, rather short article that was um, on, on amateur photography that was describing how the Colombo looked during the, the conference in Colombo, because it was actually a, a huge urban exhibition of the amateur photography depicting the life in Nam countries. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just... No, no, it would be great to have it on website. And actually the idea is 
of course, uh, from uh, one side to have these heritological experiments in the sense that uh, we don't understand monument just in literal sense as monument by attention, but as something re uh, related in distant or close relationship to non-aligned movement, but of course to uh, build a network within the whole non-aligned world as we want. We hope to succeed, but <laughs> we don't know. A website will be live for uh, several years, so um, I don't know. I will contribute uh, in the future with other cities in Serbia. I saw also that something in Zab Zagreb was called Salvador Allende, if I'm right. I saw it in archives of Yugoslavia. I don't know, it's, it's part neighborhood in Zagreb or maybe street. Monument, yes, I saw that uh, in the archives of Yugoslavia, but um, for now I can do this in, <laughs> in Serbia, in Belgrade in the future, but I hope for the cooperation within different parts of the world for the website. Um, we've got time for one more question. If nobody wants to ask it, I will. <laughs> Um, I, w I want to ask Brigitte, and it's um, all my questions are strange, but I'll try and be less strange than normal. I mean, I think what I loved about your presentation is this complexity of any kind of political aesthetics of the global south. And you were hinting at this kind of balance between flexibility and a political statement. And I wonder, is there any, is there any exhibition you can point to after 1995? That, that, that you know a lot about, or even only a little bit about, that perhaps got that dynamic between flexibility and a, a clear radical political statement better than the, than, than the exhibition you were, you were telling us about? Yeah. Um, thank you, Paul. It's not that strange, <laughs> so thank you for the question. But as I mentioned earlier, that the NAM Contemporary Art Exhibition in 1995 was uh, one that has not been followed up um, until recently, I think, through many exhibitions that explore the NAM legacy or the Bandung Conference. Um, that was, I think, due to the politics of the funding as well, the international funding of global contemporary art, which are still mainly um, coming from the rich countries um, from the north or in, 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 in Southeast Asian context, for example, or Asian context are from Japan or Australia. So the, um, this ge geopolitical imagination of um, looking back at the legacies of Bandung Conference and um, um, the non-aligned movement was not really, or yeah, maybe since the last five years, we see more and more prolifer proliferation of, of this exhibition. Um, I can only perhaps mention to you um, um, what we have in Jogja, the Jogja Biennale, which since uh, five years ago have this, have a conceptualization, uh, conceptualization of internationalism through the Equator line. So every year um, they, 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 they visited or collaborated with one country uh, in the Equator line and moving around the, uh, and, and moving around the globe. Like for example, the first one was with India, second one was with the Arab countries, um, third one was with Africa, and so on. And I think um, it was an, an, an interesting um, way of um, exhibition making in terms of um, 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 international geopolitics because it doesn't have the ambition to be very global or very totalizing um, in, ter in terms of trying to understand the world, because as Nada Beros um, 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 criticized, actually large-scale exhibitions with too many countries are impossible to, um, to contextualize everything, and the audience just became a consumer of this diversity of things that we cannot really understand each of them. So I think, um, yeah, Biennale Jogja actually um, provided a way to, to rethink about internationalism in a more intimate way and less ambitious, but still have a very strong um, view of um, alternative internationalism. Excellent, thank you. Thanks so much. If there's, if there's no more questions, I'm, I'm going to close this panel. I, I want to thank Anna here, uh, Brigitte in, in Indonesia, and Mila in Paris. Um,
I'm going to stop now, but I imagine somebody's going to make an announcement about films and dinner, for those of you who are not on Zoom. Um, but tomorrow morning at 10.30 Central European time, the second keynote lecture from Sarah Salem from the London School of Economics uh, will be on. So thanks, everyone. Um, and see you later. Thank you. Ah, veg. Sorry. I'll stop. Thank you, Paul. Bye bye.